after a substantial layoff, done a lot of traveling. Uh, Tim, you 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 were just in uh, you were just back home. How how was that? Back home in St. Louis was uh, very nice. Uh, humidity, just getting going there. Hey, it's the Midwest. Uh, you know, what are you going to do Midwest in the summertime? <laughs> My mom yesterday was already here. It's kind of overcast uh, and, and been, been cloudy and a little bit drizzly for a few days. Uh, high temperatures maybe topping out in the um, coastal areas where you are over there. 60s, 70s where I am. Uh, maybe 75 in St. Louis, 98 degrees, 100%. Humidity. Holy cow, really? That hot? Already. Already. Oh, wow. Already. Yeah, you're, you're not, not, not even summer yet, but whatever. That's what, that's, that's what it was. A lot of fun. My mom's 80th birthday. So, hey, mom. She Fantastic. Congratulations, mom. That's pretty great. That's oh, great stuff. Oh, well, we were uh, we were just in uh, New York and it was the most beautiful weather. I didn't want to come back because it's better than California. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it yeah. was fantastic we had a three three hour long meeting in central park and people were playing and jogging and, and just the picnicking and it was amazing it was sunny and beautiful it really it, it a wonderful time in new york right now beautiful 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 <laughs> yeah and uh and uh we were we were also uh in europe uh some weeks ago during spring break and uh i can't believe we're already talking about last spring break uh <laughs> and and i was able to pick up some 4ks uh that are not available here which made me very happy including uh the elephant man oh and uh what else did i get there on 4k i've got them sitting around here somewhere um Hold on. Let's see. Yeah. Elephant Man. Gorgeous. Black the and white. The Elephant Man. And, uh, oh, gosh. I got him. I can't even remember the rest of them, but I jumped all over them. It was a, it was a bunch of great 4Ks. I'm like, we don't have those yet. So the Elephant Man was the, uh, the big one for me. Yeah. Um, Let's 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 go through some of the obits. Norman Reynolds died. Uh, Norman Reynolds, the famous Spielberg affiliated uh, production designer of yeah. Empire of the Sun and many other great things. Great, great. Uh, yeah. They don't kind of make them like that anymore. They all they're all CG people now. Norman Reynolds actually built stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1934, Nor uh, Norman, um, uh, just really uh, one of the old school guys, uh, Raiders, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's well, he, he built stuff. Uh, it, it's funny. We used to talk about this all the time. Uh, frankly, there was that moment because you and I are from that, you know, era too. You know, not, yeah. not, not as old as uh, Norman here, but we're from that era of where we grew up watching films that were made by guys like Norman. And so, yeah, and so so yeah. so those are our movies, right? And it's just interesting because Raiders is back, as you know, or will be here yeah. in a second. Uh, and uh, the first Raiders is one of Norman's. Uh, and you watch that movie. And you see all that stuff in that movie that's actually stuff. Yeah. That boulder rolling down, I that know. thing, that all stuff, all stuff, you know. And, yeah. and, and, and I haven't seen the new movie, uh, but I'm kind of thinking there's not going to be any stuff in that movie. No. <laughs> I'm thinking there's, no. I'm thinking there's going to be no stuff in that movie it, at all. It's stuff that comes out of a computer. Yeah. Yeah. And then speaking of Spielberg, we also lost Bill Butler, the yeah. uh, who who was who was nearly who was over on was he over a hundred years old? Oh, yeah, Bill Butler. Yeah, he was uh, one hundred and one. He was one hundred and one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, nineteen twenty one. Bill. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, he. Um. You know. Uh. I mean, Jaws. The conversation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. One flew of the cuckoo's nest. He kind of defined the seventies in many respects. Yeah, um, uh, and, 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 and again, uh, one of these guys who, you know, it, it worked his whole entire life, uh, uh, career, uh, in, yeah. in, in actual film, <laughs> every yeah. format of actual film, uh, uh, and, and had to understand all of that. And I, and I gotta think, you know, some of that's gonna go away, dude. Uh, I mean, cats in, uh, film school today, um, I suppose classes where they work with actual film are electives. Yeah. I'm thinking. I mean, I don't. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm thinking. Right. I mean, why would you have? Why would it be just the thing that you're doing in film school today, studying cinematography? Of course, if you're in film school today, studying cinematography, why would you touch film other than as an elective? Uh, and, I know. But, but it's what he did the whole damn time. Grease. He shot Grease. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he, I, as far as I'm concerned, if you if you shot Jaws and Grease. It's done, but I mean, I'm just you know, looking at the rest of his his films. I mean, Deliverance, yeah, um, the Rain People, it, it just uh, he did second unit on The Godfather. Uh, you know, it's just unreal. It's unbelievable. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all kinds of films, too, you know, um, uh, not just genre films, dramas uh, where people were just sitting and talking, you know, uh, 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 horror movies. Uh, uh, yeah, he, he, he did. He did, he he did Hot it. Shots in 1991. Yeah, yeah. You know, he did he did the original Child's Play. I mean, really, all all across the board. Uh, you know, it's it's really amazing. Yeah. And Rocky Three, my one of my favorite Rockies. I mean, it has my favorite montage in it. Oh boy, Stripes, Anna, Anna, amazing, Anna. legendary guy, Anna legendary Anna. guy. <laughs> it was just what you Gosh, right? Yeah, yeah, Anaconda. Good heavens. Anyway, uh, and then uh, we also lost Harry Belafonte, yeah, who I know is a near and dear to you and a legendary figure, um, socially, cinematically. Um, you know, the, the pride of the Caribbean. To, yeah. to many people yeah. uh talk about harry man and what what he meant i mean he just he, that's a that's a guy who i think some t- dwelt in unfortunately in the shadow of Sidney poitier for far too long even though they were good friends but he was kind of seen as you know both of them caribbean both of them coming up at a, at a time when it was it was difficult for black actors and and i think he was he was kind of pigeonholed under that umbrella but he did his own thing Talk he about did that. he did and that's the, and that's the most important thing and, you know, harry was honored by the academy a couple of years ago and i had a chance to, to chit chat with him then as well as a very 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 long time ago uh in a um uh, a junket for a film that, that 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 he did with john travolta Dustin Nyan film. What was the name of that film? It'll pop in my head in a, uh, in, in a second. Uh, uh, that movie, White Man's Burden. White Man's Burden. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. 1995 yeah. or so. So, you know, actually bumped into him a few times. And Harry would have said, uh, would, would say, often said that he didn't feel that he was uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Sydney's shadow at all. Indeed, very often uh, the films that Sydney uh, did and, and received accolades for were films that they came to Harry with and he turned them down. Uh, and did not regret so it. Turn, turn down the of the field. Turned him down. He's like, I can't. I I could not figure out why that brother was out there <laughs> sing, <laughs> singing <laughs> singing songs with those German nuns. I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so, but, but he but but Sydney figured it out. So while they were on um, the same path in terms of what they uh, were attempting to do with their careers, they took different routes to do it. But sometimes sometimes they crossed over. Buck and the preacher. I know that's Harry, the one. Harry and Sydney, Sydney ostensibly directing that film, although I think Joe Sargent directed most of that movie. Uh, but whatever, uh, 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 Sydney Portier's directorial would be him, him and Harry Bel- Bel- Belafonte. And what's funny is their characters in their film sort of reflect yeah. them. Uh, yeah. Harry playing that loud mouth asshole preacher, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Sydney playing this upright guy, gonna wagon trail guy, gonna lead his people out out west. It's literally, it's literally them, but they're both doing the exact same thing in that movie. That movie didn't get a lot of um, uh, love back in the day, but you got to come, you got to return to that movie and see it. It's it's uh, prescient. No, it's film. it's on Criterion now, and it it deserves to be. It's uh, it is a land it is a land landmark and milestone film for sure yeah harry deeply missed but what a what a full life really a a very very full life you can't say that he was he was taken before his time he 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 made the most of every second um speaking of jim brown um recently you know i know we got we all got very mixed feelings about jim who who has an ugly history with women but who also is an undeniable uh seminal figure because he was the first athlete to figure out that when you retired as an athlete, you could start as an actor. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so many others followed in his footsteps. Uh, Fred Williamson, you know, jumped right into that and then became a producer on top of that. But Williamson did it. It, it was Jim Brown did it at first. Rosie Greer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can. I mean, I just some freaking Mike Tyson is in a is in a a movie a french movie this week you know Mm -hmm. um there are so many athletes who who've who've made that jump but jim brown did it first yeah yeah i mean look to us in a certain way you can connect uh, that move uh to arnold schwarzenegger from bodybuilder to uh, to to actor and absolutely and and, 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 and all kinds of folks um without jim brown there is no schwarzenegger there's no no doubt about it hell our our, our good buddy sherman augustus played with the played with the san diego Chargers and the vikings in the the 80s and late 80s and because of what jim brown had done 20 years ago knew that he could make that transition all you had to do was 
was be good at it. It, it. It's funny. We talk about Jim Brown, you know, difficulty. to be honest, I have no trouble talking about Jim Brown at all. His whole career, his whole life, everything he did, even the nutty, wacky crack crap that he did with uh, with women in his life. Jim Brown's a man born in 1936. <laughs> That's a long time ago. And he was a man who was Gullah Geechee. Jim Brown uh, was from the islands off South Carolina. Uh, yeah. The interesting thing about the folks who grew up uh, uh, off those islands, South Carolina, is that they grew up in a fairly isolated community where uh, much of the machinations of, of, of the United States at that time, uh, race and racial divides and issues like that, did not affect them uh, because there weren't no white people around. <laughs> it's just yeah. plain and plain and simple. So Jim Brown grew up with a with with a, a sort of manly dynamic and attitude that one might associate with with figures like John Wayne and and uh, yeah. and, 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 and and John Ford, uh, folks like that who 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 simply just never had around him the sort of notion that he needed to be subservient to anybody. And he yeah. lived his whole entire life that way, sometimes to his detriment. Uh, uh, but this is the thing that I'll say about Jim Brown. Jim Brown took responsibility for every daggum stupid thing that he did. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was funny. You go to Jim Brown and say, Jim, <laughs> they say, you, <laughs> they say you, you, you threw a lady off the balcony. Well, I did <laughs> throw her off the balcony, yeah. and I probably yeah. should have done that. But, but I did it, and I should probably take the punishment for that. Well, you know, Jim, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and punish you for that. And he would go ahead and take his punishment for it. You, you didn't see Jim, you know, sort of whining and, and, and yeah, his, doing any of that stuff. He just took the hit for what he did, and then he tried to be better. And his interviews are are really, really very interesting. I mean, he is he's one of those guys who I mean, look, I've interviewed Fred Williamson. Yeah. And it's very clear that Fred Williamson learned two lessons from Jim Brown. Uh, because I think they played together, didn't they? They played oh, yeah. opposite each other at the time. Yeah. A little tiny and, overlap, yeah. Yeah. And and what he learned from Jim Brown, number one, was never lie in an interview always be transparent because if you lie in an interview the press person is going to see right through you yeah. they're going to know you're feeding them a line but the other thing he learned from jim brown was do it with some grace yeah because jim didn't always do it with grace <laughs> jim would just kind of lay it out there it'd sometimes be like a shock it'd like somebody throwing throwing a dagger in your face you'd be like holy cow did he really just say that and fred is just you know fred comes with the props fred yeah. comes with the cigar he dresses the part. He just, he knows how to, you know, he, Fred, Fred is just smooth as silk and, and interviewing Fred, you know, every line is like a drop of honey. And with Jim, every line was like, you know, it was, it was like a shuriken. It was like a throwing star. Oh. And Fred was it, uptown. Jim was downtown. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's, that's a good way of putting it. That's what good that way. was. But, but uptown learned to learn, learn how to roll from downtown. Yeah, and, and exactly. The other, the other thing Great I was putting it. about Jim Brown is uh, in terms of being a uh, an athlete, a movie star, an athlete um, who engaged himself in activism. Sometimes we forget about that. Jim Brown precedes uh, just about everybody there. Save Paul Robeson. Save Paul Robeson. Yeah. Uh, you got yeah. Paul Robeson and then you got Jim Brown. You just got to go far enough back to understand that Jim Brown from day one, even in college, was already engaged in the in activism uh, yeah. that, that we sort of think about. Uh, and, and, and sometimes that gets that gets lost uh, in, 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 in the midst of all those other things that we, that we yeah. just spoke about. But, you know, that's probably that's probably OK. But I remember Jim Brown was always there. And uh, lastly, your hometown girl, um, yeah. Tina Turner. Uh, I no, think we no, I think no. that was that was a shock. I mean, I know she was she was, you know, 83 or whatever it was. But but I think, you know, look, I reviewed that Tina Turner doc on Film Week last year. Yeah. And it's just filled with interviews with her fresh interviews from last year. And she looked as spry and as alert and as healthy as ever and living in Switzerland and, and just, you know, uh, eating well. And she just looked great. And I came out of that thinking, oh, the girl's going to be around for, we got a good, we got have at least another decade with Tina. She's, least, she's yeah. just, and mm -hmm. so I didn't see this coming. And, didn't see it coming uh, but I know for St. Saint, Saint Louis, I know she means something special. Well, we call her anime Bullock <laughs> over, over, over there. My mama went to high school with Tina Turner. My mama and all her sisters went to high school with yeah. Tina Turner and her sisters. 
my mother, uh, when Tina Turner was a little girl, uh, 13, 14 years old, was Tina's, was Tina's hairdresser <laughs> in Nutbush, Tennessee. All of these people are from Tennessee and they all more or less sort of immigrated up to St. Louis from the South during that period, uh, late fifties, early sixties, late to the late sixties. And, and, uh, Tina would have been a, a junior when my mother was a freshman. Uh, uh, mm. and my, and my mother does the most dead on Tina Turner <laughs> impersonation. <laughs> And I'm like, mom, if you could think like that, damn it. <laughs> what the hell are you doing over here? Anyway, uh, uh, it was, it was just so th- that's a thing. And Tina was always great. She was always a hometown girl, thus that record, that record, Nutbush, Tennessee. Uh, and, and her whole entire story back in 90, I guess it was two or three. L- uh, what's love got to do with it? Uh, uh, you know, yeah. that, that movie about her life with Angela Bassett playing Tina Turner was just this astounding thing. Lawrence Fishburne playing Ike Turner was just this astounding thing. And, you know, it, 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 it helped in, in the even further relaunching of her career, which had already uh, been relaunched in the middle eighties. Uh, and, and of course she had that iconic role, uh, in Thunderdome <laughs> with, with one of the few, one of the few uh, movies from that era where that song, uh, oh, we, we don't need another hero, uh, was, was almost as big as the movie. And, you know, it's not it's not even that's not even my favorite song from the movie. My favorite song is the one that they play over the opening titles, which I'm going to I think we might we might play that on our out music yeah, today. Uh, you know, uh, shoot bullets of fire, you know, one of the living that 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 is just an amazing song because it it. It, the, the credits are just kind of moving in over that song and it starts so softly and just like proud Mary, it just, it builds and it, and it hit, and then it hits this incredible, uh, you know, uh, crescendo. It's just, it's a great way to get you into the movie. And then you come out and there's that aerial shot and Bruce Spence is in his little, his little, uh, his little helicopter deal. I mean, it's a, it's a great way to start the movie and you basically start the movie with Tina. It's her mm-hmm. voice, if not her, her face, but mm-hmm. auntie entity, is still for a lot of people the best villain of any Mad Max movie. I love it, I, and 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 I, and I have a hard time really denying that because if I think back to okay, you know, between you know the toe cutter and uh, uh, and and uh, the you know great humongous right off to you know the last from Fury Road, um, I mean. You know, these are all kind of psychotic male post-apocalyptic, you know, villains. And Auntie Entity is very different in that world. Uh, And Tina gave her this interesting dimension. She is not a typical villain. She's running this town Mm -hmm. and she has a certain charisma to her. And she's likable when you first see her. You don't you don't sort of root for her to get her head torn off. She is. This is what she is. She's a villain. Who is not villainous at That's all? It. Not villainous yeah. at all. Hey, man, I'm. And she says it in her dialogue. I built this out of nothing, out That's of the right. desert. I built this yeah. all. You're gonna come in here and, and tell no. You got. And but you know what, raggedy man, raggedy man. <laughs> <laughs> if you, earn I'm gonna it, watch that again tonight. I'm gonna watch, watch that again tonight. You know, it's just beautiful. I, it, it, yeah, she's a villain who's not villainous. She's just trying to run her town. And you men are not going to mess it up for me. Uh, you got to earn surprise. I'm surprised that she didn't look for more acting roles after that because she could have had her pick. Yeah, Too you know, uh, it, 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 but she did of, her own thing. A lot of pressure there. And, and, and she got a little typecast. Um, I, I think same thing happened with Diana Ross. I mean, Diana Ross after Lady Sings the Blues. And, well, and, uh, and, and, you know, look for both of them. Their first love is singing. Yeah. And, and we have to remember that not everybody wants to be a movie star. Some people are okay being pop stars and rock stars. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, it's, uh, you have to look at maybe some of the actors who have, uh, who moonlight occasionally on the stage. They, or, they, they're okay being actors. And, and, and it's all, it's a little sad both ways because we, look, we, we both know him. We've both seen him. Uh, uh, Madonna always wanted to be a movie star. Never could. Yeah. Never, could, never made it. Johnny Depp always wanted to be a rock star and he, and he bought it. He bought it. He paid for it, but you're not a rock star, Johnny. But yeah. both, it's a little sad because you look, you, you are both the, the, literally the best at what you do, but you're not yeah. satisfied because you want that other thing. Mm. Yeah. It's a good point. Uh, I found my little stack of 4Ks from uh, from Europe. So I got uh, City of Lost Children on 4K, uh, which makes me very, very happy. And uh, I got uh, Elephant Man, obviously. I got Ron. Akira Kurosawa's Ron. 
Uh, all of these are like Canal Plus. That's why you get them. I got Germinal, which is the uh, Claude Berry adaptation of the Amel Zola. That is never going to get released here in any form whatsoever. Certainly not 4K. Uh, yeah. But this one uh, makes me makes me very very happy. And then uh, lastly, I picked up a uh, an incredible 4K of Joseph Losey's The Servant. Oh. Dirk Bogard, Sarah Miles, James Fox, absolutely tremendous. Uh, and that's a creepy film. Don't want to stay in a place where they chuck balls at your head. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's a movie I've seen way too many times. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's get. To, well, first of all, uh, l- quick, let's do a little bit of Hollywood chit chat about yeah. the first of all Netflix not sending out any more uh, discs. Got any feelings about that? Well, personally, to be honest, during that Netflix disc period, I probably only had twenty discs ever. You know, I just wasn't, yeah. it, it, it never, I, Blockbuster still existed, of course. So I would find myself wanting to see a movie and I would just go up to Blockbuster and get it. Now, Bridget, my wife, my late wife, she was a Netflix movie. She had a list and she didn't even know what movies were on the list. She just put them on the list and they would come and I would go to the mailbox and there'd be these movies. So I yeah. guess I was using the Netflix mailing service, but being a lazy <laughs> bastard and not actually using it there. So when I heard that it was going away, it literally did not affect me at all. But I do know that there were a lot of people ridiculously nostalgic about getting those discs in the mail. Well, we we got an email from uh, Phil Vater or Vater. I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing his name. Longtime listener, um, and he said uh, he was asking, you know, um, about r- rental options. And uh, he said, "I've been meaning to send this note for some time now, but now that Netflix has announced that disc rental will cease." I needed to send my note. Um, he says, I know you've addressed this topic on the podcast, the endangerment of discs being available as time goes on. I also wondering if you see discs going away generally and what the options are to the dilemma. Uh, and anyway, here's what I'm requesting ideas from you regarding alternative decent disc rental services or how I can get a good handle on access to titles. Um, so I would say I don't see discs going away ever, frankly, because streaming discontinues things and people like to own stuff. There's always going to be a market for them, but it's it, blue, blue. First of all, you have no idea how many DVD players are still out there in the world. It's an unbelievable number of DVD players. You have no idea how many people are out there who don't have cable and don't have streaming who are still watching with rabbit ears, uh, uh regular broadcast television and not paying for it. Yeah, me. They, they, you know, yeah. I mean, there are. It, it's it, it's real. So I'm, I'm, there are I, millions. I, I, you did right about 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 the. And you and I are the exact right age to know this as a fact. Yeah. Uh, our vinyl collections. Yes. We, we some of us, some people gave up, and what are yeah. they doing now? Recollecting their vinyl. That's uh, right. And, and then there's right. those of us who never gave them up and had the good sense to hold on to them in the first place. And, and we have these extremely people want stuff, dude. I have my VHSs and I have three functional VH, VHS players. When the Internet goes down, you can't watch streaming, but I can still pull out a disc. Mm-hmm. And when the Internet is throttled, I, you know, you can't get your full resolution. I can still put a 4K in and watch the, the best picture there is. So yeah. uh, there you go. As for disc rental options, um, I got some that I sent to Philip, and I'm going to name them right now. There's Gamefly.com, which mostly rents uh, video games, but they also rent movies. Uh, so, you know, you create a queue and you can do all that. And there's Movie Only Plan. It's about nine bucks a month. They've, you know, they, they don't have a ton of movies, but they have movies. So Gamefly.com. There's also Redbox. Uh, red boxes, you know, uh, stuck around and somehow made that business model work. There is a 3d Blu-ray rental at www.store dash 3d dash Blu-ray rental.com. Not the easiest, uh, URL, but, uh, it's, it's worth checking out blog.scarecrow.com will take you to the Scarecrow rent by mail system from Scarecrow video, uh, which is kind of a, you know, they're Seattle based. It's a rent by mail program. Uh, it's, it's a little bit clunky, but they've got a ton of titles, 145,000 titles. So, um, you know, you, you, you should be able to find something there. And then lastly, your library, your local library, uh, everybody's local library has mm-hmm. has Blu-rays and DVDs and 4Ks that you can rent. Um, and what's available obviously depends on the librarian mm-hmm. and what they're what they're choosing. But they they have a 
they have a job to do and their job is to make sure that they stock a lot of great books and music mm-hmm. and movies and, and, uh, and, and libraries, fun. all that stuff. Love it. So you'll find it at the library. If you have a good library system, you live in a good city uh, or even, you know, a good county library system, you'll you'll find that stuff. Um, let's let's talk about the the strike right now. What do you what's what's your vibe with the strike? Because I've been trying to keep up. I keep meaning to, I keep meaning to go down and join some of my friends on the on the line in front of uh, the old 20th Century Fox lot. But I haven't gotten down to do it yet. But, you know, your 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 vibe. Well, look, um, um, uh, this strike, I think, will probably become strikes over the course of the next uh, several days. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, the SAG and the directors have deadlines, I think, June the 30th or something like that is at least one of them. And negotiations are already underway there. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I'm taking this from people that I'm talking to, like you, uh, who, who are sort of like on the inside a little bit. So uh, it that anything would resolve before SAG goes out, I just don't think it's possible. I just don't think it's possible because all of the th- same things are at issue. Uh, and, and, and one thing builds on another thing. Do um, you feel like we're uh, going to have writers and, and uh, actors uh, striking at the same time? At least there will, there will be some overlap. It's never uh, happened it, before. Never, never. It, because of the way of the order in which these things happen and, and, yeah. uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and then there, and then of course the directors too. The directors are a little bit different um, uh, you know, they do have, uh, they, they do have a contract. There are some things that issue. They're, they're not quite the same. So I don't, I don't know how much leverage, uh, but they want some of the same concessions. Some of and, them. And if they give them, it, yeah. if they, if they give up the data to the directors, they're going to have to give it up to the writers and the actors. And that takes away a big, and, and, you know, AI, the, the issues with AI are relevant, you know, substantially to writers, but also to directors too. Uh, and actors, uh, and actors, and, and actors. actors. And Sherman and I actors, was talking. Right. Sherman and I was just talking about this yesterday. Um, uh, voices and whatnot. Uh, not to mention, and, and you want to you want to control. I mean, in the age of AI and deep fake, actors are now terrified that they may not get to control their voices and their likenesses forever. I mean, you heard you had that Joe Ro- that AI replicating Joe Rogan's voice. That is terrifying. I've, I've, I've been I've been playing around with myself for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, so much it, for voice print identification. Oh, it's, it's, it, <laughs> and, and and the thing of it is, it will only get better. So, for instance, Sherman, uh, you know, made this movie. Uh, uh, yeah, our, our, our homie Sherman uh, Augustus over on Stranger Things made this movie. Needed to do some ADR. Right. Uh, they kind of, and this is all stuff you get paid for, by the way, as an actor coming back yeah. and doing ADR and replacing lines, all that kind of stuff. It's all working income generating stuff yep. and, and work for you to go and do. But you know, they hit them up and they said, we're good. And you know why they were good? Oh, AI. No. Because they had an entire catalog of Sherman. You know, he's in the whole freaking movie. So, you know, and all they do is feed the AI his voice. And the more of it they feed, the better it gets. So when it came time for them to, you know, the ADR, they just told the AI and they got clean passages of Sherman saying two, three words, a sentence. Right. And see, you, if you do that, you need to pay the actor as if they came in to do it. To do it, which is one of the things the actors will be yeah. fighting for when their contract comes. Yeah. Up. And, and it's wow. writers. You and I are both writers. So this matters to us. I would look, I'm technically in the writer's skill. I haven't paid a writer's skill go- dues in over 25 years because, you know, I don't know. Uh, but, but, but once was in the <laughs> guild. Uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, and so, and, 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 and all of that. So for us, uh, these scripts that you and I have written over the years and that have gone into the world in one way or another, some of them been made or whatever, um, that becomes of the great, a, a part of the great wow. AI pool, right? Yeah. And, and all yeah. of that AI out there looking at movies that you and I have written, some of them made, some of them, that AI is taking story, is, you know what I mean? And then writing. So, so we got these buddies in Atlanta. And, yeah. and, and, and these are guys, you know, who was talking about, you know, uh, hiring a screenwriter to write the script. They have these concepts or whatever. They feed the concepts into the AI. And the AI are spitting out scripts for these guys. Now, to my mind, these scripts are terrible. Yeah, of um, course they are. But they'll get better. Uh, uh, but they'll still be terrible. But these guys, rather than pay a, a, a SAG screenwriter the proper rates, you know, to, to, to write a script, um, what they're doing is paying, like I said SAG, I meant WG, Writer's Guild. Uh, what they're doing is paying Writer's Guild writers to script doctor the scripts. 
right? So they still yeah. get a script, script doctored by a real writer, a writer skill writer, but they only right. got to, but they only have to pay a script doctor's fee, much letter, uh, less than the, uh, what you would pay a writer to, you know, originally write an original script, yeah, right? That's, I just, uh, that's, I'm getting down the weeds cool. now, but you, but you, but you see what no, I'm but those about. are, I do. And, and, uh, you know, these are all issues. It's going to take a bit to, to detangle them. How long do you think, the, what's your gut tell you about how long the strike's going to last? Uh, I think top of fall, I think to, uh, September is, is, yeah. is, is, is what I think. That's my gut. What, I mean, what are you, what are you thinking? What are you hearing? Well, I mean, I, you know, I talked to a lot of people who have some insight into it and they, and they say the sides are so far apart that even if we started to get close today, literally today, if we started to find points of agreement, just in terms of how long it takes to, to negotiate those points into legal language, that then is drafted by attorneys and put into a document, which they then have to vet. Even if we start getting close today, that process cannot be concluded before August. Mm. That just, just in terms of the logistics of the doing of it, you know, it's not like, I mean, you, you actually have to put this stuff into legalese and, mm -hmm. and attorneys have to go over it and people have to vote on it. And, and that process alone, just in terms of the time that it consumes, cannot be completed before August. So that's why I'm beginning, you know, when people told me, oh yeah, not before September or October, I'm now I realize why. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of feeling like end of September, beginning of October looks like probably the, the right time frame. I don't think they want this to drag on into award season. Uh, these companies have too much to lose in terms of relationships and money and the holiday season um, they, you know, one, if it drags on into award season, now you are putting next year's summer movie slate at risk because mm -hmm. those movies have to, have to, you know, they, they're going to, a lot of those movies are shot. Um, but you know, they, they may need some rewriting if actors are not available for ADR, that kind of stuff. Now you're, 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 you're making it very, very hard for them at the, in the long term. You're putting at risk what may be the first normal movie year for the box office since pre-pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. next year was supposed to be the right year. And Hollywood suspended all of its COVID guidelines like two weeks before the strike started. So we're still in this force majeure period, right? Mm -hmm. it, it hasn't been normal for over three years. So everyone is eager for a normal year again, a normal $10 billion box office year with summer movies. And, and if you, you drag this out too long, it wipes out next year as well. Yeah, it's a whole yeah. other it's a whole other write off. So I feel I do feel like companies that are that are obsessed with quarterly earnings are not going to want it to let it go past October. Uh, they just can't. They can't. One of the That's things that feeling. the writers are doing now, literally as we speak, is they've they they started to take the focus and push it toward executives. Um, yeah. uh, they're 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 out there oh, now yeah. talking about executive compensation. You know, mostly they talk about their compensation, this AI and all this kind of stuff. But now they're drawing the very direct comparison to executive compensations, which I got to tell you, dude, are obscene. And this is why, because I never care about how much money anybody makes. I, I'm all for making as much money as you can if you earned it. If you yeah. earned it, I'm looking at all these executives and I'm talking about across the board. Now, I don't see anybody who's earned a nickel that they've made, let alone the let alone the multi hundreds of millions of dollars that they've made. If you make me a billion dollars, I'll glad you, gladly pay you a hundred million. Yeah. You lost me eight billion dollars. What the fuck am I going to give you one hundred and sixty three million dollars for? So the the one that really, really stings, and let's be honest, Netflix is where most of the sticking points are. Netflix mm -hmm. uh, in their buyout model, their non-residual model, re is the one that everybody has been really bitter about because nobody knows how successful stuff is on Netflix and however successful it is long term. Nobody gets a piece of it because they're all their their rights are all bought out. Mm -hmm. So that's going to change. All of that is going to change. And Netflix doesn't have a backstop. All the other studios, they're backstopped by multinationals. They have they put movies into theaters. Amazon sells stuff online. Apple sells computers. All these other b companies have other businesses. Netflix does not. Streaming is all they are. They're billions and billions and billions of dollars in debt. They have never turned a profitable quarter ever. Mm. Their, their stock price keeps going up based on expectations of future profitability. And based on that, last year... Um, uh, Ted Sarandos and uh, Reed Hastings each took a $50 million bonus. 
Now, that's $100 million in the pockets of two men who don't make movies, who don't make TV shows, um, and whose company has never turned a profit. And the writers are uh, struggling to pay their mortgages. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. awfully, awfully tough for them to justify that. Mm-hmm. It really is. It's very, very tough. So they have to understand that they are the face of this strike. Yeah. And uh, and people are going to want them to, to eat some crow. You can't they, justify they really it do. morally, but nobody gives a shit about morals. But you, so you no, can't, no, no. But, so you can't justify it to stockholders. I own some Netflix. Yeah. Like, not a lot. Yeah. I got a little. And and so I feel like I can I can say I'm a yeah. little pissy about all of that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah. so, and you'll multiply me by however many stockholders there are. There. Well, real quickly, just a couple of things before we finally get into uh, the DVDs and Blu-rays. Um, VCI Classics has now launched a streaming app, and uh, they did this last December. It is not available on Apple TV yet, but that's going to be coming this year. But it is on Roku. So, uh, you know, keep an eye out for that. VCI Classics is going to is going to jump into the streaming market. It's a crowded market right now. It's getting even more crowded. People don't have money for all these services. But VCI has a great library. I think they'll find a place and some uh, and some followers. And um, we we also had some inquiries, uh, notably from uh, Mario Mendez, longtime listener. <laughs> Wanting to know what happened to our online show. Still working on it. A lot of things in in the works. You know, I'm as as everybody knows, I've got this, this feature thing that we're we're pushing as well. So we're we got a lot of balls in the air, but we're gonna we're gonna get them all together at yeah. some point. Um, thanks for asking, all, though. Thanks for asking. Thanks that for means, asking. That means we penetrated a little bit. Appreciate it. Yep. Yes. And then I uh, had a little correction on my recollection, my David Bowie recollection. Um, uh, we uh, came came from. Um, Al Lai, longtime listener, uh, said, begging your pardon, but must get clarification. You say Bowie was with Iman at the Greystoke screening. Greystoke was released in 1984. <laughs> um, and I don't think uh, Bowie met Iman until a blind date in 1990, and they married in 92. So, yes, my recollection, I'm sure, was merging things. Um, he was... He, he, he goes on to say he was dating and engaged to a Melissa something, one of Tony Basil's dancers during the 1987 Glass Spider tour. I love I love Bowie fanatics. They know yeah, this stuff. I love it. Well, she um, was Melissa, a tall sister with a long neck and amazing legs. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, because I can see how you get, I see I can see how you get that. <laughs> Bowie was with somebody, and in my mind, it was Iman because that's just who Bowie was always with. Yeah, but um, yeah, sister. that's who she would. Yeah, somebody else, somebody else. Anyway, he goes on to say uh don't mess with a bowie fanatic seen him nine times I love it nine uh, times I, well i hope he i hope he has uh, well there, there are two bowie documentaries now right uh uh the one from before he passed yeah. uh i gotta look those i gotta look those up but, but i'm sure we've talked about them uh on the show those two those two yeah. boy those two bowie documentaries gotta have them. all right well let's uh let's jump in let's let's start with the 4k stuff Okay. Let's uh, let's start with the 4K stuff first. Right off the top, Star Trek Next Generation 4 movie collection 4K. This is all the Next Generation stuff in one key, one little thick keep case. Star Trek Generation, Star Trek First Contact, Star Trek Resurrection, uh, Insurrection, sorry, and Star Trek Nemesis. Uh, you know Picard and uh, and. Hey. Uh, Riker and the gang and Jordy yeah. and Worf and all of them. That movie gave us uh, Tom Hardy. He didn't give us Tom Hardy, but the young Tom yeah. Hardy, you know, young Tom Hardy. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's some interesting Michael and Denise Okuda text commentary stuff in here. Uh, some featurettes, four part featurette on uh, Brent Spiner and data and, uh, you know, other little fan service stuff. It's all fine. It's not an amazing collection of extras. But again, you know, you're getting it because you want to watch these movies in 4K. Do they look good? They look really good. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, um, you know, how do these movies hold up is my question. And I got some thoughts, but you you first. Well, first of all, these none of these movies are great. But I, you, so you have to be a fan. You have to love it. You have to love Next Gen, the series and all of that kind of stuff. And then it becomes necessary for me. They're necessary, but but they're not necessary in the way uh, that the first set of original Star Trek films are necessary, particularly, say, Wrath of Khan. There's no equivalent yeah. to Wrath of Khan in this movie. Nemesis comes close. Nemesis comes close. It does. One thing I do like about these movies 
is that they bleed over into the balance of the Star Trek next gen stuff, Picard, uh, uh, mostly, uh, rather nicely, references and stuff like that, uh, back through uh, First Contact and Insurrection and even Generations. Uh, that if you are a Picard fan, the next uh, a generation and Picard fan, I like those little touchstones there. So not a great set of movies in gen uh no 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 wrath of khan here uh but you know i i'm a fan of all this stuff dude so yeah well i i'll say i like generations because shatner's in it and you get to see shatner and picard together and shatner's on a horse and it's a it's a whole <laughs> it's a it's a whole dumb thing of mine i i just anytime shatner's hamming it up i do enjoy it so i like that um uh, first contact. I'm not a huge fan of. I think it kind of screws up the storytelling. However, I'm a fan of one part of uh, first contact, and it's a part where they're all crawling through some kind of a tube, mm. um, and Alfred Woodard is, you know, kind of looking where she's going, and she she turns out of uh, out of the tube. She keeps crawling down this air duct or whatever it is. And then uh, our good friend, Dean, my good friend, Dean Heyman Mason from film school, uh, who, who was employed as an extra on that film. Dean makes the most of his close up right behind her. He turns to his, he shoots his profile right in the camera. It is a beautiful thing. I still laugh at it Go to this Dean. day. Dean. I absolutely Dean. love it. Go Dean. Yeah. Uh, no, that's it. That's it's just my favorite part of that movie. It's I, I, I don't care about the rest of the movie. I just yeah. enjoy Dean crawling, crawling uh, on, on Alfred Woodard's uh, heels. Uh, Insurrection, I think, is a terrible film. I just think it's absolutely hor- horrible. I, I yeah. can't. It's unwatchable. And yeah. then uh, oh, Nemesis, I think, is pretty good. Nemesis is pretty good. You know, that Tom Hardy uh, is it, it, yeah. strong in that movie. You know, he registered with me, you know, playing the sort of clone of or whatever the hell yeah. he is of, of Jean-Luc over there. And again, all of that is going to be called back to, you know, here 30, 25, 30 years later, uh, which yeah. I think is all kind of neato. So yeah, there you go. Uh, we also have the haunting of Julia on 4K. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's uh, you know, uh, gosh, what do you want to say about this? It, uh, um, it's not a great film, but it has become kind of a kind of a culty film. 1977. Uh, you know, uh, a mm-hmm. a. A, a horror film very much of its a supernatural horror film very very much of its moment trying to take Mia Farrow and and mm-hmm. make her replicate the Rosemary's Baby thing uh Keir Delay is is you know appropriately creepy in it as well and trying to work a little 2001 stuff out of it on balance I don't know if it's it it really holds up that much, but as, as far, you know, it's, uh, it's also coming on the heels of the exorcist. Mm -hmm. So it's still trying to, it's trying to keep, you know, the whole omen exorcist, Rosemary's baby thing in play at the late time of 1977, when those movies are going away and Halloween and Friday the 13th and slasher films are kind of coming in. So, I mean, as a transitional film, I think it's got some, some credibility. Well, and you look at it, yeah, Mia still has that little short haircut that, that she had been wearing, you know, whatever, however long that yeah. would have been, 10 years, eight years, eight years before. She's did sexy in this movie, though. Tom Conti, yeah. young, young, young Tom Conti in the movie. But it's just weird sort of crossover movie. You're watching this movie and it's a contemporary movie, you know, 1977. But you feel like you're watching the movie that was made 10 years earlier. Yeah. Uh, as you say, when at that time in 77, dude, it's Jason. It's, you know, whoever yeah. you're running around doing all yeah. Yeah. stuff this is kind of like not the thing anymore richard richard low crane uh yeah we've also we also got a 4k steel book uh best buy exclusive for crank with uh jason statham uh not a fan of this movie but it's on 4k a lot of people are this movie just it, the whole point of this is that it's a mile a minute movie real time intense action highly stylized uh it, you know it it's a little bit of a gimmick uh that these you know, this is kind of hyper adrenalized action film based on you know a guy who's got to save his life and he only has so much time to do it all this junk but uh for people who are into that then you know you run out to best buy and grab yourself the the crank steel book um m night Shyamalan's knock at the cabin uh 
Mm. Uh, I don't know. Did you did you see this? And did you think you have any opinion about it? Well, you look, look at, to me, these last few M. Night movies, including this one, have been uh, better than that chunk of work right after his whole, you know, six sense trying of, to keep, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Know, and these are all smaller in scale. And, you know, they have very centralized, very, you know, old, I think is another one uh, there. So to, to, to that extent, I'm like, yeah, you know, these are as effective as any of the. the, the so I, when I, once I stopped looking for some big, gigantic, M. Night, Six Sensi, the villagey, the blah, blah, yeah. blah kind of thing, and just let M. Night make his little movies that are about the little things that they're about. They fit. They're just fine. They work just fine. Yeah, the, there's a central dilemma here, which I won't give away, but there's a really interesting existential dilemma, which is something that people always bring up in conversation. You know, it's it's one of those horrible what ifs. And so he's what he's doing is he's taking that horrible what if that is usually hypothetical and trying to frame it in a in a very realistic sense, like it could really what if it really happened. And to that degree, I think there's some, you know, some interesting stuff in here. Uh, I like the cast. I don't think the movie's great. Dave Bautista, I just think, is one of the most underrated actors. Talking mm-hmm. about people who go from being one thing to another, from being an athlete to an actor, you know, yeah. that Jim Brown trajectory. Dave Bautista, there's another one. Yeah, he can play that uh, drama. He can play that. He can play empathy and vulnerability, it, d- despite that the size and all that kind of stuff. You know, I, don't, yeah. I, I like M Night at the scale better than yeah, at, better than at the scale of you know the you know whatever, whatever big gigantic crap he's doing. I agree. Uh, we also have Deep Impact. Uh, there were a couple of these at the time. I forget what the other uh, one was Armageddon. called. Armageddon. Uh, that's right. One. Armageddon was the other one. Forgot about it. Anyway, I th- I thought Mimi Leader did a much better job with this. She had never really went on to have the uh, the big Hollywood action career that she deserved. She was coming mm. out of TV doing a lot of stuff like China Beach, and she and she created right. a lot of that style. You know, uh, Mimi. Yeah, we forget ER. That, that the ER. She was the one that said, "Let's get these cameras moving, man, and let's yeah. do these long runs of dialogue." Uh, she took yeah. she took Clooney over to the uh, what was that movie they did together? The Peacemaker. That's right. Peacemaker. Hey. Great chasing. My gosh, the yeah. car chase in that is tremendous. That long thing. With Clint, it was great. Yeah. And Mimi had to, and, 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 th- and this. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really good stuff in this. Uh, Morgan Freeman, Tia Leone, uh, Elijah Wood, Vanessa Redgrave, Blair Underwood, you know, Maximilian Shell even shows up. No, there's a lot of, lot of great stuff in, uh, in this movie. I, I think it's still a little bit uh, on the Hollywood obnoxious side, a little overblown with the CG and whatnot. But you know what? Mamie's a really good director and gosh, I really, I wish she would come out of her TV moment again and get back to features, but maybe she doesn't want it. Hey, well, look, uh, this, you could stay at home with TV. There was this and there was, it was Armageddon. So this Mimi, yeah. this, Bruce, this is Bruce Joel Rubin, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and Armageddon over there is uh, Mike Bay and, uh, you know, whoever. JJ, I think JJ was one of the writers uh, uh, on Armageddon. I think JJ. Oh, maybe, gosh, could have been. Maybe Tony Gilroy. And you were either an, this both 98. So you were either an Armageddon person or you were a deep impact. Yeah. <laughs> person. That's right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, and I Very remember true. that we would have these little, you know, battles. Oh, Deep yeah. Impact was a more serious movie, if you can say, you know, a movie about a, yeah. you know, it's a serious yeah. movie. And then they Armageddon made it. was just cheese. Yeah, yeah, you know. And then they did the same thing with Movies to Mars a couple of years later. That's right. It was, oh, you know, gosh. The, the, that, you know, yeah, so I'm sure we'll talk about those soon. Little superhero action on the DC side. Justice League uh, and RWBY, Superheroes and Huntsmen, part one. This is utterly silly. The crossover between Justice League and RWBY. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's uh, it's all in the service of branding. So they have a little bit of fun with uh, this very strange animated quasi anime fusion concept in this uh, DC animated movie. And it's a cliffhanger. So there's more coming. Mm. I, uh, you know, I couldn't get into it, but I guess, you know, for the for the core fan base, they'll absolutely go nuts. On 4K, it is very, very impressive. I'll say that. They've really turned it up. When they do 4K on the DC animated stuff, they really, really bring out all the animation. It's just super, super crisp. The contrast is great. The blacks are really dark and rich. And, uh, you know, the it does kind of give it a better comic sheen. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I, a lot of great that. young voices too. I mean, one of the things I like about this series is that you hear all these great voices and they're young voices because your characters are sort of young and they're not movie stars. Uh, they're voice yeah. actors. Uh, it just yeah. really kind of like when we were growing up, you know, and all those great voice actors were, were out there doing stuff. Yeah. Very often when you, when you move a notch up to the stuff that's going to be theatrically released or it's, you know, whatever, you start getting all these movie star voices, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking over these roles. But these, these folks, these are great voice actors, and I love what they do. So let's talk about uh, Shazam! Fury of the Gods for a second, because one of the bright spots for DC in the pre-David uh, Zasloff, pre-Discovery merger era was that first Shazam! movie. They, the, the Snyderverse was kind of falling on its face. They were messing that up very badly. No fault of Snyder's. We have to give him credit. You know, that that was just the the Joss Whedon and all that stuff. It was just, it was, you know, Wonder Woman went, did well, but the rest kind of flopped and Mm -hmm. Shazam came out and it was really fun and it did well. And it was a a surprising success. And I think everybody had really high hopes that this one, despite black Adam being a big stinker, Mm. I think everybody kind of felt like, no, but people run out and you know what? They didn't. Mm -mm. And it kind of flopped. Uh, Was it the black Adam? impact on this did that just kind of steal some of the thunder so to speak uh or or was this movie just not good enough or are, are people sick of this i don't well, know yeah you get a little bit of all of it but at the top of it these movies aren't good black adam at the top of it wasn't good it was not a good movie uh and at the top of it this is not a particularly good movie you know uh you, you, in, in 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 the and uh the one before before that uh uh not so you pack all of these quote-unquote super Superheroes. This is another one that's just packed full of superheroes. Uh, yeah. and, and, and into a movie, and you and you wrap them in, in in a whole bunch of special effects, and have them doing whatever special effects stuff that they're doing, and 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 whatever almost arbitrary. Sometimes these storylines are almost arbitrary. Uh, because yeah. what we're really doing is servicing these characters, the movie stars playing these characters, and the crap that they have to do. So so you know, and and audiences aren't dumb. Uh, we, we can see all of that. And, and, and by the way, you and I were entertained uh, in Superman, uh, you know, original Superman, Chris Reeve, 1976, whenever the heck it was right there. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the only Superman, the only superhero in that movie was Superman. <laughs> Lex yeah. Luthor wasn't even a superhero. Ned Beatty was out. There. One, uh, su- I know. It's one movie, one superhero in the whole movie, you know, and, 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 and we loved it. So why why the notion is you got to have 10,000 superheroes and supervillains. Superman was the only dude that could fly in the only one we needed. And he was fine. So I'm going to make a I'm going to make a real interesting pivot here. You know, Superman and Lex Luthor, at least in the (laughs) comics, were childhood friends turned Mm -hmm. nemeses. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the same story of Adonis Creed and Damien Mm -hmm. that is depicted in Creed 3. So let's pivot from Superman to Creed 3. And it's very Superman and uh, Lex Luthor-esque storyline. Because now we got Michael B. Jordan taking over as director and still a star, taking, you know, the reins from Ryan Coogler. Mm -hmm. Um, Jonathan Major's showing up like, you know, with a body that that Mm -hmm. shames even Michael B. Jordan's. Um, did we need this movie? You and I have had this conversation. So did we need Creed 3? Need, uh, complicated. Is it a solid movie that, 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 that is, that definitely establishes itself as legit in the long Rocky canon Creed 3, yeah. but you know, we're really talking about something that goes way, way back here. Uh, and, 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 and there has to be touch stones all the way through which there are yeah. uh and th- this movie continues and that and that's one of the things i like the most about it it has a deep recognition of the entire legacy yeah. right uh, um uh, of what's going on um um this is what i like about this movie and i like this movie you know and of course this movie came out before all the shenanigans with what's his yeah. name and all that kind of stuff so you know, I, so i just when i watched this movie i, I kind of got it clean and and pure uh what I like about this movie is that it's not about boxing <laughs> at all. Yeah. Despite right. all the fights, it's a whole bunch of fights in this movie. But this movie has nothing to do with boxing and nothing to do with fights. Uh, this, yeah. this, this, this is a brotherly love story. This is about a man being deeply, deeply hurt. Yeah. This dude hurt him emotionally. This is about yeah. emotional 
hurt. It's going to manifest yeah. itself and play itself out in a whole bunch of fighting <laughs> in this yeah. ring. But and, the, and and this is about guilt. This it's, 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 he's like, oh my god, I let my boy down. I let yeah. him down. I did. And he and and and, and, and I, you know what I always say about about uh, about about sports movies. Uh, when you watch a sports movie and and the the team that you're rooting for or the person that you're supposed to root for uh, loses and you don't care. Yeah. That movie was not about the sports. <laughs> you know, Rocky loses that first fight in that right. first movie. You don't care. That's right. Matter of fact, it's a better movie because he loses. Yeah. Uh, 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 and and this movie is the same kind of thing. You don't you don't you don't care who's going to win. What you want are for these guys to to work it out. And the the whole chunk of this movie that's about brothers working it out. Uh, that all that stuff in the barbershop, you know, uh, yeah. uh, all that yeah. stuff with these guys, you know, I'm like, these guys don't, I keep wanting to say, don't, can't you see you're in love? <laughs> you, yeah. you know? yeah, yeah. That's what I keep wanting to say to these guys, cut it out, you know, work it out, boys, work it out. And they do. So that's what I think about this movie. It's not about well, Mike, Michael, Michael B. Jordan can direct. Yeah. Uh, that's the other big revelation here. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to see what he does when he's not putting himself in the movie. I think I think give Michael B. Jordan uh, uh, a job with with where he can just be behind the camera the whole time. I think he's he's definitely <laughs> earned that, too. Uh, let's pivot back to Superman, because mm-hmm. also we now have the five film Superman collection, 1978 to 87 on 4K with Blu-ray and digital code as well. So you can movies anywhere, this thing, uh, to your heart's content. And I intend to. Um, here's, here's what's included. Superman movie, which Tim was just praising, mm-hmm. from 1978. Superman 2 from 1980, which I think we all remember uh, was supposed to be the film of the summer. And then Raiders came out like a week or two later and blew it out of the water. The Superman 2 Richard Donner cut, which, yes, is superior. Mm-hmm. Superman three. Mm. What mm. the hell were they thinking? Mm. And Rich, then finally, Richard, Super- Richard Pryor got a million bucks. <laughs> that, I, <laughs> that I know for sure. But even he was disappointed in that they really only wanted him to play it for the comedy. And yeah. he told because Richard Pryor was a very good dramatic actor. Richard Pryor, some kind of hero with uh, that Vietnam movie he made. With, yeah, uh, and, yeah, uh, and 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 and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and a few other movies. Uh, what, was it Straight Straight Time? Uh, straight Time. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Schrader. Yeah, great great role in in, in Lady Sings Rules. Richard was a very good dramatic actor, and, yes. and and he knew he knew it wasn't Shakespeare, but he thought yeah. that they would give him something to do. But they really, literally, there was no script. They would just have him vamp. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, so, but he took the million bucks. So what the hell? Yeah. Well, and then Superman four, the quest for peace, which nearly killed superhero movies entirely. Uh, that, that just was a mess, mm. a, a complete and total mess. But nonetheless, it is the, you know, uh, Christopher Reeve is, is remembered very fondly for this part. These are the movies he made. This is every cut. That of every movie that he made on 4K and uh, loads of special features can't even get into. They have done really a beautiful job. Warner Brothers always does beautiful job restoring it. Uh, the colors just sparkle. The sound is beautiful. The John Williams music in, in the first film has never sounded more beautiful. It really, really, really just sings. So, uh, you know, Superman fans, go for it. Grab that sucker and uh, and enjoy it. Um we also have Flashdance on 4K, finally. Oh, my, my gosh. My gosh, 40th anniversary. It's been 40 years since Flashdance. Tim, what a feeling. Ah, uh, man. Look, that movie, um, it's just, I just loved it. We went to see that movie in 83. Uh, yeah. before, before we came to LA, so you know we were still um, uh, 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 yeah, not 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 part of the Hollywood community. So for us, it was just this movie, and it was Adrian Lane, and and of course Jennifer Beale. It was just this wonderful, wonderful movie. And I, one of the things I think it does is it proves that you know before he went bananas, Joe Osterhaus could actually write. Yeah, <laughs> he was a pretty good writer. I, I, I here's here's what's funny. And this is kind of my my Top Gun trajectory, because, you know, I hated the original Top Gun. I worked at the theater at the time. I was there. I heard that damn thing. I saw that damn thing every day over and over and over and over. I just thought, what a stupid movie. Why are these people cheering? And I loved it last summer. I loved it. Um, Flashdance. When I first saw it, I just thought this is the dumbest movie I've ever seen. I love this movie today. It's pure nostalgia. This came out when I was working at the theaters. Right. And I look back and I don't think we realized how good we had it. First of all, let me just say on 4K, 
unbelievable. The 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 famous dance bit oh, yeah. with the with the water and the silhouette and the whole thing, which is the cover, by the way, of the of the four K. Uh, that has never looked so crisp. If you're watching that on a proper set, uh, e- e- a TV set that really will just bring out all the richness of four K, you won't believe it. Turn the lights out; it'll just blow your mind. But I'll say this: I look back on that era of Paramount movies. Mm. And this kind of represents it. You had Sherry Lansing and Stanley mm-hmm. Jaffe and mm-hmm. Bruckheimer and Simpson and Eisner and Katzenberg. All of these people at the same time at the same studio mm-hmm. who would go on to make other studios very, very wealthy when they finally broke up. But that was an um, unbelievable core of people. An hey, incredible core it, of people. And these were all people just, who were willing at that period, uh, at, at there anyway, to let movies abandon any sense of reality. Yeah. Uh, at, at, at all, the, nothing, there was nothing real about this movie at all. No. Jennifer Beale was a welder at this place that was backlit in neon all the yeah. time, day or night. Uh, it was it's such a preposterous <laughs> idea. Jennifer, Jennifer Beals is a welder. Just stop. It all just, just stop. But that off the shoulder, uh, that off the shoulder uh, 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 yeah. sweatshirt thing that became yeah. an actual clothing, thing. actual thing. This, oh, this that was from this gosh. movie, and it penetrated the whole society. Uh, uh, every uh, every girl in Southern California started wearing that, and you know what? God bless them for it. Thank you. It was, I, it was I, I, thank you. And, and, and the kids uh, break dancing on those cardboard boxes, right? That which is which yep. is a thing, and I'm sure that it's in the uh, uh, on the special features on this on that uh, on that uh, uh, what is that a 4K. Uh, uh, yeah. or, or on that 4K, you know, it's, uh, all, it's all it's all on there. It's, it's a ton it. of yeah. stuff on. He'll he'll talk about how they were out and they were, and they they saw these kids and they shot them and that goes in the movie and the next thing you know, kids all over America are spinning on <laughs> cardboard boxes on their heads uh, because of yeah. that moment in this movie. So you know, anyway, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those moments. Uh, I forgot to mention this earlier. There's also another DC animated uh, 4K. It's All Star Superman, it, which is okay. It's it's a it's a you know a Lex Luthor thing. Superman's dying, and Luthor's going to you know rule the universe, and uh, and then, you know of course it all resolves perfectly fine. Um, the, this is not great, uh, but I guess for Superman completists, you can probably suck it up. Uh, you know, Ed Asner, yeah, and voice talent here is really the only thing that I I found sort of uh, entertaining and amusing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We also this is one of the ones. This is one of the ones just the, the the opposite of what I was talking about before. Because you're, you're yeah. Ed Asner, but you got Anthony Lapaglia, you got Christina Hendricks, you got Linda Cardellini, uh, you yeah. got all these movie stars. You know, if Francis Conroy, <laughs> you know, I mean, all these movie stars, and, and I don't know, I just, I find that ridiculously distracting. Uh, and when it I, is. You know, so uh, rather than just voice actors just knocking it out, I don't know, just it, whatever. It's a bug up my ass. And as part of the Warner Brothers 100th uh, anniversary celebration, and Disney is also having a 100th celebration, although remember, Disney, it's not the 100th anniversary of the studio. It is the 100th anniversary of the creation of Mickey Mouse, Mm. which is what they trace their lineage to. But for Warner Brothers, this is legitimately, you know, 1923 to 2023. That is a legit 100th anniversary uh, uh, celebration. And uh, they're releasing a lot of old classics on 4K. I got three right here. Uh, cool Hand Luke, The Maltese Falcon, and Rebel Without a Cause. All three I would recommend. They all come with the Movies Anywhere code. They all come with a reasonable amount of special features. Um, you know, commentary on uh, Rebel Without a Cause is particularly good. It's by uh, Douglas Rathgeb, who wrote The Making of Rebel Without a Cause. And it's got some, you know, Blu-ray. the Blu-ray also has some uh, behind-the-scenes things and a lovely, lovely... Uh, uh, memoir uh, in- involving Dennis Hopper. The Maltese Falcon has a ton of stuff, most of which we've already seen before, uh, including a commentary by Bogart biographer Eric Lax. And then there are a few things on uh, Cool Hand Luke, uh, you know, a commentary by uh, Eric Lax as well, who also has written a Newman biography. Um, but on balance, I think all three of these films represent exactly the kind of film that we associate with Warner Brothers. And that's the point I wanted to make and see if you agree, because, you know, Maltese Falcon, it's that tough guy thing that they started with. But but uh, all the way straight up to the present day with Clint Eastwood, who's been a part of Warner Brothers history for, for 50 years now, um, Warner Brothers is, let's admit it, it is a studio that has a very male profile. 
Mm-hmm. And they were not a, a, a studio that made necessarily women's pictures. When they did, it was Betty Davis. And Betty Davis is not exactly anybody's mm-hmm. idea of, you know, a quintessential woman. It wasn't like these melodramas. That mm-hmm. was for Columbia and some other studios. The Warner Brothers too, was film noir. If you think Warner Brothers. That is film noir. noir. Yeah. And Cool Hand Luke, Paul Newman in his day, and James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause, they sort of represent exactly what Warner Brothers has always been, which is a a studio that explores the many facets of uh, conflicted masculinity. And so I think this is an interesting trio of films to release all of these from, you know, different eras, but all kind of living in the same space. Mm. Your thoughts? Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I I agree completely. Uh, Complicated films with complicated leads, not exactly anti-heroes per se, you know, uh, uh, cool hand. Yeah. Uh, and Luke and all of that kind of stuff, but 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 films with leading male characters uh, who were uh, difficult to like um, um, uh, and not always right, uh, and I, I kind of like that about both of these films. And you're right, just they're just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, let's get into some some TV stuff right now. Mm. Got a whole bunch of TV here. Uh, The two that I want to just mention right off the top of the bat, uh, complete series collection on Blu-ray for Cheers, which has been long, long awaited. I'm thrilled that it's finally here. And a uh, and a lovely Mill Creek complete uh, series Blu-ray set for Dawson's Creek, which weirdly enough is like this. Mm. really old series now like james vanderbeek is now yeah. in the news looking looking like a really old guy and get, being really pissy about the possibility of not having any presidential debates and uh look i saw that clip on social media and i thought weren't you just a kid like five <laughs> minutes ago in dawson's creek it's a very strange thing oh but, yeah, all uh, these kids. you know what's interesting about dawson's uh creek is that all those kids made it you know, uh, they're all I know, right. You no, know, no, they're all very successful uh, actors right out there in the world. And what they do and then, you know, me a little bit. Katie married Tom Cruise for a second there. But, you know, got to get herself together. <laughs> but all of these kids made it. And they were kids when I encountered them. I watched Dawson's Creek, the entire series. That seen, I've seen every one of those. Uh, I was a big yeah, fan. It, uh, but they all so made let's it. Talk, talk about Dawson's Creek for a second. Why, what, what was it about that show? Because Michelle Williams, if I was going to pick somebody to come out of that show with a head of steam and become a super movie star, I would have picked Katie Holmes. And I would not have said Michelle Williams will become one of our great actresses yeah but yeah she has it's well, really yeah, you interesting know, well, well you know while katie still you know a, a, a perfect so so that show at the time and i would have been uh i think i was in, in 1998 uh i would have been about i would have been about i don't know i was i was uh in my in my middle 30s or something like that so watching that show all of those kids were younger than me it did a couple of things that i thought was really great excellent writing about actual storylines that struck me as real uh yeah. a really great dramatic professional story making and filmmaking it had a cinematic sort of dynamic which was interesting because dawson was like this kid who was hooked on steven spielberg movies you know i'm not gonna yeah. take people into the entire thing but that was the right. thing so 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 there were all these sort of references this this is kevin kevin williamson and then all of these kids michelle and joshua and katie and james in particular just could act their asses off. These were not the kids of the sitcoms and or quote unquote dramatic shows that you and I grew up watching the Partridge family, uh, 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 the Brady bunch, uh, you know, with these sort of terrible scripts and terrible acting and terrible <laughs> filmmaking of shows that right. we still love to this very day. No, this was like, wow, this is like, this is like real dramatic television, uh, that happens to be about these teenagers. And uh, a lot of good stuff on there is interviews and commentaries and some really, really wonderful stuff. It is it is a more landmark seminal show than I think a lot of people want to give the it the music. For. I forgot to mention the music. Every one oh, of those yeah. shows had uh, 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 contemporary music uh, that, that and, and of course, broke some contemporary artists of, of, of the day. Every single one of that, that music, them and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, they were all doing it. And cheers. I just can't say enough about this. You know, this show still has it casts a long shadow, not just because it's one of the great all time sitcoms, uh, but but cheers. Let, let, let's remember, it didn't just spawn Frasier. It, there's a new Frasier series. Mm-hmm. So cheers still has a spinoff on the air that's starting again. And uh, I think that may be the, the longest 
time uh, one character has been on television ever. I, mm. I, 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 I might be wrong, but Frazier, uh, you know, played by Kelsey Grammer, is just uh, he's not going away. What a great show this was. Uh, loved Kirstie Alley, the late mm. Kirstie Alley, who, who stepped into a very awkward situation here, a show that was literally defined in its first several seasons by the Sam and Diane on again, off again uh, romance of opposites. I mean, it was built around that relationship. And when Shelley Long left, a lot of people said the show's over. You can't, mm. you, you can't, that, that, that's the central tension of the show. You cannot, all those great sporting characters, you can't, you can't do it. You can replace Coach with Woody, but you, you can't replace Diane. And mm. son of a gun, they brought in Kirstie Alley, and it was a whole new show. And then they brought in Frasier and Lilith, and they found a way to use that bar to manufacture more than just that original premise. Mm. And mm. I, think, I think that's a credit to the writers uh, and the directors and, and just all the magic that they wrought on this incredible show. Yeah, man. James Burroughs, Glennon, Glennon, Les Charles over there. Sam and Diane became a phrase that you could yeah. use to reference a sort of they were yeah. real Sam and Diane. Uh, I saw I saw the I used it in reviews. <laughs> I used it in reviews where I said, I I can't even remember what movie I was reviewing, but I said, boy, the you know, the movie depicts this couple as being more on again, off again than well, Sam and Diane. <laughs> I don't even remember what the movie was, but I remember I made that reference. Uh, and, and of all the people you look again, lots of great talent, you know, you came from and out of and all the, but if you had told me, you know, the one who's going to actually go on to become a legit Hollywood movie star and will remain so for the next thirty years is going to be Woody, <laughs> you know, the the I goofy know. bartender who replaced uh, Michelle Williams. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's Michelle I'm Williams. Like, I'm like, get out of here! That guy's going to going to become a, a big. Oh, movie. But he just walked right into becoming a major legit Hollywood movie star, leading yeah. man, villain, uh, you know, capable character actor. Uh, and who would have thunk? Who would have thunk? Couple of complete series here from very different eras. We've got the complete series of Go On with Matthew Perry. Uh, it's a complete series because it just didn't last very long. Mm. Uh, it's 22 episodes, but, uh, it's an okay show. I, I think it was a little bit of a misfire, but it's, it's a good thing to watch for Matthew Perry fans. He's good in it. The rest of the show just isn't very good. Uh, and the original uh, 1957 television series Blondie. Uh, from Classic Flicks, F-L-I-X. They've uh, just released the um, a two-disc set with 26 episodes of this very strange ad live-action adaptation of the comic strip, mm. which in hindsight, did you ever have you ever seen this? Ever seen any of these? Because oh. I hadn't seen these ever. Uh, so yeah. I think you, maybe it was on, because you're a little older than I am. So this may have still been there for you, but it wasn't oh, yeah. there for me. Oh yeah. And look, I gotta, I gotta be, I gotta be square with you. Uh, Blondie, who played Blondie? Uh, uh, what was her name? Uh, what Pamela is her Britton. name? Uh, yeah, 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 that played blonde. Yeah, uh, if, yeah, if, I think so. Yeah, yeah, gorgeous with the dude. I had a thing for that chick because uh, because <laughs> I'm like I'm like I'm like she, if that's the one, Penny Singleton, Penny, Penny Singleton. Singleton, Penny Singleton. Yeah, yeah blonde. Yeah. That was a little bit later one. But were they both yeah. Arthur Lake uh, uh, as Dagwood? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, maybe, I'm, I'm definitely maybe. thinking of Penny definitely Singleton here. And, Arthur and Arthur, definitely yes, here. yes, they changed blondies, but Penny Singleton blondie. Oh my God, uh, she she was she was as gorgeous and had a better body than Marilyn Monroe. Uh, wow. you know, with baby dumpling running around those. Yeah, those were on uh, all the time when I was when I was a kid. I used to watch them all the time. Yeah, it's yeah. such a peculiar. I mean, if you don't know the comic strip, you kind of miss a lot of the jokes because it really is riffing on it. Hal Roach Studios tried to, you know, legitimize themselves in a for, for television or the, the early stage television with this. And I mean, it's a it's a really fascinating artifact. I don't know that it 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 dates terribly well, but it's got a lot. If you know the comic strip, there's a lot of really funny stuff in it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and Blondie yeah. is still a thing today, I guess. Right? It's still in like two thousand newspapers, is what the the press stuff was telling me. Well, even in the so cartoons, that's nuts. look that stuff. People, look, you look it up. Go look it up. You'll see what I mean. It's um, it's very right. interesting the way that stuff was sort of shaped. And we got some individual season stuff here on Blu-ray. Uh, got South Park in its twenty fifth season, wow. still killing it. I don't know how those guys keep doing it. I would be exhausted. It's just the the turnaround there. You know, Mark used to talk about how they, they turn those an episode around in like a week and a half. Wow. I, I mean, I don't know how you even do that with an animated show, but that's how they, they stay on, on the news cycle. 
Uh, we got the third season of His Dark Materials from uh, HBO, which I never really got into, but uh, I know a lot of yeah. people love this. I watched that. I watched that. Yeah. 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 Not 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 heavy on the extras, but uh, that is definitely uh, out there on Blu-ray. Um, Primal, the complete second season. Uh, you know, in totally insane animation, a little bit anime inflected, but um, I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of get it. I mean, it's uh, it could be, it could skew completely young, mm. <coughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't really. It it still skews a little bit, you know, grown up, and uh, it's good animation. It's really good animation. It's won a bunch of Emmys, and uh, you know, so uh, you know, check check that out. It's mm. better than it's like Masters of the Universe for adults. Ah. Maybe a better way of putting it. NCIS Hawaii season one. Let's talk about this for just a second. Um, NCIS is doing what all the other acronym shows have done, which is just venture from city to city, whether it's CSI or Law and Order or, you know, uh, 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 what's the other one? Oh, my the, God. Uh, Vegas. Uh, do, do, are they in Vegas? No. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Anyway, uh, NCIS finally says, you know what? Let the, let's go uh, steal some thunder from uh, Magnum and, uh, and Hawaii Five-0. Uh, does it work? I don't know. Um, I guess it's a beautiful cast. It's mm-hmm. very, you know, very CW looking cast. But, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it makes sense. You know, you have Pearl Harbor as a backdrop and it's never really been a backdrop for a TV show uh, outside of World War II. So, um you know, mm-hmm. beautiful people. They get to take their clothes off occasionally and do the Hawaii thing. Uh, love the Hawaii setting. Uh, yeah, man. I, look, bro, that's a mess of pretty cops. <laughs> that's, a whole, <laughs> that's a whole lot of pretty cops in one place. So I, yeah. I'm not sure, but hey, roll with it. Uh, if you And Magnum on Magnum, okay, fine. You know, because that's what we're doing. Uh, but I'm like, really? Seriously? Now, and, and the other thing is uh, the original Hawaii Five-0, you know, the one that you and I grew up with. Oh, what I yeah. liked about that show is I bought all of those cops. Uh, every yeah. single one of them. Bought totally. them all. Dano, bought, bought them all. Bought them oh, all. Every one of them. Uh, you know, every one of them. I don't know. Yeah. This, this is a lot of pretty cops, but whatever. Uh, Walker made it to season two. Mm-hmm. I, I, I always thought it was very bizarre that they wanted to resurrect Walker without Chuck Norris because the the whole point of the show was that Chuck came with all this real cheesy baggage and uh, it was more about Chuck Norris than some guy named Walker. So mm-hmm. you replace mm-hmm. Chuck, you're what's the point? But uh, they're into a season two. I guess somebody watches this show. I I don't I don't really get it. Uh, Jared Podolecki or whatever his name is. Uh, he's fine. Pretty face. Uh, but it, it still feels like, you know, Magnum P.I. in a cowboy hat. It's a family drama. Walker, Texas Ranger, you know, the one that we watched at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, it was a cop you know, thing. There'd be some crooked bad guy doing something. And him and, 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 and Travis Trickle, Trickle, whatever his name is. Who yeah. Is his, with the, and I always liked that the brother wore the white hat and Walker wore the black hat. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, I'm like, that's cool. And they would roll out and they would catch the bad guy. Uh, you know, um, uh, and this is a family drama and there's all kinds of stuff that's going on at the house and at the ranch and stuff with the dad, the mom, and the. I'm like, I don't think I ever met Walker's mom in that other show. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty sure his mom was never in an episode of that show, but you know, she's in this show. Yeah, and then uh, Yellowstone season five, uh, which has a which has a very very judicious uh, sticker on the packaging that says includes the first eight episodes of season five. Um, you know, I mean, the whole Yellowstone thing, I have, I have been trying to sort of get into it from the beginning Mm. and, uh, uh, all of our friends who, who love the show, they're, they're ridiculing me for not, you know, buying the, the whole thing. I'm like, but it's dynasty on the prairie. I don't, you know, Mm. they're like, that's the whole point. Yeah. All right. Okay. Fair enough. But you, but there you go again. You and I come from the world of Dallas, the original Dallas and Dallas. Dynasty, dude, Flamingo yeah. Road. I mean, the originals, you know, not yeah. the yeah. CW stuff. We, no, uh, we, yeah, we come from there. Falcon Crest. Falcon Crest. I'm like, you guys, you guys, you guys are kidding. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. like, dude, we have JR, the original JR. This is all funny to me. Um, uh, but, you know, I will say that uh, this about, about uh, that, about this show, everybody wears a black hat in this show. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, seriously, everybody is. I'm like, okay, yeah. uh, they're laying it right there out there for you. Everybody wears a black hat. 
Yeah. And then lastly, Star Trek Lower Decks season three, um, you know, the other Star Trek animated show is like a sitcom and whatnot. I mean, you, you got to tell me what people see in this. I know a lot of people love this. Our friend Luke Thompson loves this. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. It's like, it's just, it's, I don't know. What's yeah. the point of this? <laughs> I don't know. All the, all the guys with red shirts. I, look, it's, it's, it's for the same crowd because I don't really watch this so much, uh, uh, other than just go familiarize myself, uh, lower decks indeed. Um, that, that, that are still watching and still love that South Park that we just talked about a second ago yeah. after 25 years. Now, look, I appreciated me some good South Park, uh, for, I don't know, a decade or so, 12 years and, and whatever, but, after a while there, and so I, but I still got people who watched 25 years worth of South Park have not missed any of it. I, yeah, I, can, I can't, I can't do that. I have, there's some things I can let go. I can let go. And this was well, one we, I was we, able to let look, go. We do, we do film week. So we have to, we have to cram, you know, like, I, I, I mean, I don't know what you're, I know, I know a little bit how you handle the, the film week uh, roster. I always tell myself, Oh, I've got two weeks to, you know, kind of ease myself. In. And then I will find myself on a Friday night before we have to tape the following Thursday, literally six nights. And I, and I say, ah, uh, I, I guess if I watch one or two movies a night, I'll make it. And then Sunday night rolls around and I'm like, Crap, mm. I've got three days to watch like nine movies. So I wind up basically watching movies from about 8 p.m. until two in the morning every single night mm. for like three or four straight nights. That's how I do it. And it's not healthy. No, no, it's, 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 it's a thing. And I, that happens to me a lot. Uh, sometimes though, I, I, I will try to get out in front of the game, you know, uh, yeah. and just, and just, and, you know, particularly if we get the list a little bit and you look, you can go, you know, what's going to be and then you get out in front of the game and you reach out and you get a few of these things. And I, in, in a good two weeks ahead of time, I will have watched three, four, maybe even See, five of the films. You're yeah. so much less procrastinating than this I am. This is why that's bad, because by the time we get to show day, I can't remember. <laughs> I jacked. I bowed. I'm like, but what? See, what Tim, movie? I... We ju- on this week's show, literally, there was something I watched on Monday, and by Thursday, I was sitting there staring at the title, trying my best to remember what it was about. <laughs> you know what I'm like, uh, I, it's, it might be better just to, just to you know put them all together real nice and neat you know I peek know. behind the curtain yeah. uh, I want to mention a couple, a couple of steel books real quickly there's also a Best Buy exclusive of uh, House of a Thousand Corpses the mm. 20th anniversary wow. edition of the Rob Zombie film wow. which is maybe the only decent wow. thing he's ever directed uh, can you believe it's been 20 years since that movie oh that is just I did the I did the, um, I did the junket for that movie the whole damn thing no I cannot believe that that's, uh, that's nuts Sid Haig Karen Black you know uh, uh, just nutty and uh we also have michael mann's uh miami vice in a new unrated director's edition on blu-ray from mill creek a nice steel book uh colin farrell and jamie fox we hope jamie fox is recovering well from his his recent uh health scare uh seems to be he's back on social media so we're we're sending him all of our best hey well he's a community uh, guy for you i mean he's i mean yeah he's a you oh, know, yeah. celebrity for us but for you he's the guy in the community oh yeah yeah no no his his daughter his daughter is uh, about uh, four years older than mine so we were all at the elementary school together for for a couple of years and uh and he even he even guest guest assistant coached uh my daughter's basketball uh team at one point <laughs> um tremendous guy just a really awesome guy and colin farrell who i adore i've never met but uh you know he's now an oscar nominee and so it's a little, you know, it's a little weird watching these guys in Miami Vice play these parts that were originated by yeah. two other guys yeah. on TV. But uh, you know, um, the, the movies, it's not, you know, it's it's very different from the TV show. Michael Mann wanted to revisit it and reinvent it, and I think he did it uh, reasonably well given all the constraints at the time. Uh, also, we have a couple of uh, animated things on uh, Blu-ray to make quick mention of. Looney Tunes Collector's Choice Volume 1, part of the Warner Archive Collection. They're putting out some uh, of these Looney Tunes that were previously on DVD, and now they're out. They're going to be doing a series of them, it seems, making the Looney Tunes Collector's Choice series. So a lot of these are out now on Blu-ray. Uh, some of these are really, really quite memorable. Um, mm-hmm. Stooge for a Mouse is a really, really a great classic. Dog on Cats is a classic. Uh, What's Bruin Bruin is is very <laughs> memorable. And and one of my favorites is the one right at the top, Beanstalk Bunny. I absolutely adore Beanstalk Bunny. So uh, some great Looney Tunes mm-hmm. in that uh, in that first volume. 
And then a really interesting thing here, Max Fleischer's Superman, 17 theatrical shorts from 1941 to 43 from uh, D.C., part of the 100th anniversary celebration, including a new featurette that's all about Fleischer's Superman and the animation. Uh, a little bit of a controversy with this, that they restored this without grain. They they did a restoration mm. of this and a digital uh, a version of it that is um, – it's interesting because normally we'd object to that. They, when they, if they do it with something like the Maltese Falcon, you want the grain, you want to feel the film. The argument here is that if we strip the grain out, we're, we're more faithful to the artwork Mm -hmm. and that you want to replicate these animated efforts, uh, more closely approximate the Fleischer artwork than the filmic quality of projecting that artwork on a, you know, an old 1930s, forties era, Mm -hmm. uh, movie screen. I'm not sure I totally buy it. I kind of wish they had given us both. But at the same time, it, you've never seen the Fleischer artwork look so good and so pristine. So I've yeah, got to give it some props for that. The, the notion being that the artwork, uh, which would have, of course, not had any grain in it at all, had grain added to it by the transfer process right. way back then. So uh, the thing that we were watching was was, there you was, go. was not the intended thing. It's just was, it was, it was a, ne- a necessary artifact of the process. Uh, Precisely. But, but if the process had been better, <laughs> then, then, then the image would have approximated this, not that. Uh, at the time, yeah. it's just, uh, yeah, 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 precisely. Uh, and as long as we're talking about Warner, let me uh, let me roll through here. We have because uh, we've been off offline for a few weeks. So a lot of Warner Archive collection titles have come out. Wonderful old classic Warner Brothers movies, all of them worth mentioning. Uh, I'm going to go through these as quickly as I can and uh, highlight some of the ones that are really, really worth checking out. There's Clash by Night, which is uh, really Quite wonderful in hindsight, uh, a forgotten mm. Marilyn Monroe performance mm. along with Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Ryan, mm. Paul Douglas, really um, kind of a good one of the better <laughs> Hollywood efforts from Fritz Long, uh, yeah, you know, Odette's, Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Based on the, the Clifford Odette's play. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a good Fritz Long film that everybody kind of forgets about a little mm. bit. Um, Ricardo Montalban has never been better. Young Ricardo Montalban looking unbelievable. Mm. I mean, unbelievable in mm-hmm. border incident, um, which is a which is really quite along with George Murphy, kind of a surprising movie for its era. When you look at it through a current day prism Mm -hmm. uh anthony mann directed this you know it's it's dealing with um the you know conflict at the mexican-american border Mm -hmm. and given you know what's happening today you look at this and you kind of go man this is this is kind of a you know if it's not a movie ahead of its time it certainly reflects that the times haven't changed Mm. uh so that's that is uh well worth watching but ricardo montalban is just amazing James Cagney in A Lion is in the Streets, one of his great powerhouse performances for a guy that short to look this big on screen is just unbelievable. Raul Walsh directed this. Yeah. Um, really a, a pretty, pretty great, pretty great movie. Yeah, uh, even on that poster, uh, uh, the great Barbara Hale would go on the Perry Mace. Even on that yeah. poster, he looks gigantic. <laughs> you know, they got just, down he, low, yeah. it's just it's a powerhouse performance. It really is. Um uh, Storm Warning is also a pretty great movie. One of those great dramatic parts by Ginger Rogers. Uh, I heard some really interesting Ginger Rogers stories over the weekend. I'll tell you after the show. Uh, <laughs> re- no, re- it's uh, stuff I shouldn't be sharing on the show, but really uh, some really interesting stuff. Anyway, this is one of those movies that, you know, she made when she would go off and say, hey, I'm not just a dancer. Uh, and uh, she's in this with uh, it's a heavy some, movie, man. Yeah, you know, I mean, some, yeah. Char- some character actor named Ronald Reagan. I've never heard of. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dor- Dor- Doris Day. Um, they're all really good in this. They oh, are. Dude, this it's is just, a movie about the Clan. Uh, yeah, I know it's a tough it's, movie. It's a, it's a movie. This chick goes down and her, her sister's married to this guy in the Clan. It's a and a murder and a whole thing, dude. This was heavy duty. Stuff to be talking about in 1950, and it is, it's, it, a, it's, it, it's, it's a noir, it's a crime movie, but with an almost just, entirely white cast. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a little weird to have a clan movie with in which you know there 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 are no actual black people. Yeah, <laughs> um, but but nonetheless, I'm I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it was it was a risk at the time. And it awesome. was the kind of look. This is when we're talking about the films that Warner Brothers made. What we're talking about earlier. This is that toughness. Mm -hmm. That is so identified with the brand. You know, it's that precisely Uh, a movie called Safe in Hell, 
which is a pre pre code kind of semi noir. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's a little, it's a, it's a little rough and a little raw uh, as pre code films were, but stylistically as well. Uh, 1931, you know, you can you can tell that there's, you know, they're getting the sound and the picture working for this new technology. But um, you know, it was uh, originally made its first national uh, Vitaphone picture. Now in the Warner Brothers library, and uh, mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a good little gritty you know crime film directed by William Wellman, and uh, you know my, it's a, it's a nice thing to add to the library. Well, again, this uh, is this is that's your content that would be even rough today. You know, the, the hookers and prostitutes yeah. and rape and, and oh yeah, all, yeah, all, all that preco all stuff, kind of, all that preco stuff, and and thirty one, and uh, yeah, very good, very very raw. Uh, William Powell and Kay Francis in One Way Passage. William Powell is just always absolutely delightful. And uh, this is this is just a classic William Powell quasi thin man performance. And uh, while we're checking out, it has a couple of vintage uh, Lux radio theater broadcasts on it uh, that, are, that, you know, it, it just gives it a little bit of more of that period sheen. If you love William Powell. Mm. And then lastly, this is the one that I really, really love. Another Raoul Walsh film. Uh, Strawberry Blonde with James Cagney and Olivia de Havilland and and, and uh, some some young punk named Rita Hayworth uh, <laughs> in a sporting part. Uh, no, this is a this is a terrific uh, film. This is really an awful lot of fun. And uh, it's it's just it's all that stuff that you associate with classic Hollywood movies. It's funny. It's romantic. It's you know, it's just got a wonderful, wonderful script that's very, very clever. And it's got some great kind of farcical uh little twists in it. Rita Hayworth, uh, you know, is, is not a star in this movie. It's a supporting mm-hmm. part, but you look at her and you just go, Holy cow, you're amazing. You're literally showing up Olivia de Havilland and James Cagney. Like now you see how stardom is born. You show yeah. up on that movie with some big stars and you steal those scenes from them. And you just, you, you, you tip your hat and you go, yeah. you, you, you knock it out of the park, girl. A lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of fun faces uh, pop up in this movie. George yeah. Reeves going to be Superman. George Tobias, who was uh, going to be uh, the bewitched. He, he, he played the husband across the street. With her. And uh, just all kinds of uh, Herbert. And I just love, a lot of great faces. And I always love seeing them pop up in these movies, uh, you know, uh, where you just weren't thinking about them at the time. But now oh, when true. you see them, you're like, oh, well, look, this Alan Hale. Alan Hale. That's, that's, right. that's just Skipper from Gilligan's Island. He's in this movie. All kinds of neat stuff. Mar- Marlena Dietrich, Arthur Kennedy, and Mel Ferrer in Rancho Notorious, another Fritz Long film, uh, more more famous Fritz Long film, really very very good. Um, Susan Hayward in the uh, the wonderful I'll Cry Tomorrow. Um, you know, Susan mm-hmm. Hayward kind of a little bit forgotten today, but delivered so many really really great performances. This was an MGM film originally. Uh, directed by Daniel Mann, the other man, not related to Anthony Mann. Um, but yes, yeah, Susan Hayward, you know, just a terrific melodramatic actress at the time. Uh, Greta, Greta Garbo, Lionel Barrymore and Robert Taylor in Camille. I mean, you know, it's Greta Garbo and Camille. I'm sorry. It, it just That doesn't need to be even uh, given any further uh, <laughs> recommendation. It's just right there. And it also includes... The 1921 silent version with Rudolph Valentino and uh, Alan Nazimova and Alan Nazimova totally forgotten today. But it's nice. You get both versions of Camille and, uh, you know, one directed by uh, George Cooker. And, you know, that's the, the one that we all remember. The Greta Garbo film. Got to have that if you're a Garbo fan. Joan Crawford in Flamingo Road. Mm. We we're just talking about the uh, Flamingo mm-hmm. Road TV series with the. Uh, uh, um, the oh gosh, why am I drawing a blank now? Um, Morgan oh, uh, Fairchild, uh, Morgan, Morgan Fairchild, Mor- Morgan Fairchild. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, which is which is very loosely adapted from this, mm-hmm. but uh, it's still kind of cool if you know the TV series with Morgan Fairchild and you watch this, you go, oh, I see the DNA. That's pretty cool. They mm-hmm. kind of did a t- yeah, I get it. Uh, Joan Crawford is great. Michael Curtiz directed this one. Mm-hmm. Just a few more here. Uh, Lucy and Desi in the long, long trailer, uh, which was made fun day. of at the time. Huh? Just watched that the other day on like PCM, one of the you know places where it runs all the time. It was gorgeous. Uh, this it's is so good right. looking, right? It's like the most amazingly rich Technicolor. It's almost like they, they felt like, you know what? Everyone's been watching these people on TV in black and white for so long. Let's make up for lost time and just add, like quintuple the color in this movie. Mm. 
it's really kind of amazing. Um, yeah, they they really overdid the color. But what a what a fun slapsticky movie! I, oh, I, Vincent I, Minnelli I, I at his best. It. Vincent Minnelli at his yes, really. Good. Yeah, right. I mean, the people just don't realize like that this movie even exists. It's really a, a super super fun movie. And yeah, they got uh, Minnelli to direct it. I mean, can't go wrong. Uh, Joan Crawford again in Our Dancing Daughters. Uh, this is also a, a very, very early Joan Crawford performance. It's a silent film. 28, 28, uh, 1928. Yeah, wow. 1928. Yeah. Right, right on the on the cusp of uh, moving to sound. And, you know, Joan Crawford, um, bigger star in the sound era than in the uh, in the silent era. One of those who made the transition because. It, it just favored her. But really, uh, very, very interesting. If you only know Joan Crawford from her sound films, this one is worth checking out just for its historical value. Mm-hmm. Uh, Clark Gable, Gene Harlow, and Myrna Loy. What a trio that is in Wife versus Secretary. This has been out on uh, DVD a million times. And uh, it's finally out on Blu-ray. James Stewart in a, in a supporting performance. Uh, really a, a very, very fun uh, kind of... S- it's not a screwball comedy. It's kind of a screwball romance, but mm-hmm. it's very, mm-hmm. very fun. And they're all really wonderful. That, the title, uh, Why First Lady, today, that's, it's not it even a reference that makes any sense. You, and, no. and certainly the, you, you can't, you, cause, but that was the thing all through, you know, sitcoms and everything. It was the secretary. Oh, you're secretary. And I was, yeah. it, it's all just not even a, you can't even do it. Yeah, uh, we've, we've got Edward G. Robinson in Confessions of a Nazi Spy, which that that it, it, title leaves nothing to the imagination. I wonder <laughs> what this movie's about. Uh, anyway, no, this is uh, uh, this was the uh, this was one of the first really great propaganda films mm-hmm. that was made during World War II. To well, uh, 1939, technically before right? World War II, well, yeah. before the U.S. entry to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was it was uh, it, it was it was made right before war broke out. But war was inevitable. Mm-hmm. Like everyone knew it was coming. So Warner Brothers just figured we're going to we're just going to get in on this and uh, and, you know, take a fire the first salvo so yeah it, it was uh it was right there on the cusp and it's it's benefited over the years ever since um mm. apparently it really was quite volatile that at the time a lot, a lot of screenings were you know uh, very heated during the period because we forget you know there was a lot of, even before war broke out a lot of people in the west supported hitler they thought he had he'd like found the magic formula yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. mr so, Lindbergh, mr Lindbergh, mr ford uh-huh. mr ford a whole lot in in the UK as well. I no. mean, that's the one of my favorite. My favorite Merchant Ivory film, Remains of the Day, is very much about the uh, you know that's the character that uh, um, Fox plays in that movie is is the, one of those fr- those English aristocrats who who wanted to try to bridge you know bring Mister Hitler to and his ideas to the UK. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a scary time when you look back on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Neptune's daughter is just a delight. Red Skelton and Esther Williams. Uh, this is, uh, an, one of those great MGM Esther Williams vehicles. It's a whole lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's one that is, is near and dear to me, obviously, because it's, it's, uh, it dovetails with the, you know, Busby Berkeley. So, uh, I, you know, uh, can't help but sort of appreciate what's going on here. Uh, Anything uh, with Xavier Kuvat, Kugat in it is all right with me. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And then the last of the uh, Warner Archive titles here is uh, Robert Donat's Oscar winning performance in Goodbye, Mr. Chips, mm. along with uh, Greer Garson. Uh, just, you know, they, they remade this as a, as a musical with uh, Peter O'Toole, which I am not as disdainful of as a lot of people. But I still think this original performance by Robert Donat is so unbelievably wonderful. He won Best Actor in 1939, ahead of so many others. Jimmy Stewart in uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, ahead of Clark Gable in Gone with the Wind. I mean, he he beat an incredible field, and uh, very deservedly so, as this beloved uh, teacher in this wonderful, mm-hmm. wonderful British boarding school melodrama. And I, I still think Goodbye, Mr. Chips is a is a fantastic classic and one of the best films of 1939. Oh, began, began my fandom of of great teacher movies that goes on yeah. to this day and includes all kinds of wonder, wonderful movies that begins with Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's hit some of the Criterion titles. 
and the arrow right. titles uh, as well. There's one main arrow title here, uh, Lover's Lane, mm. a uh, one of those slasher films that uh, from the slasher film era uh, about uh, you know a uh, an urban legend known as the Hook. Um, did you ever see this? Is, uh, it's is, a bit is, of a... is the one from 99? Uh, uh, that, the, the, that John Stephen Ward film? I remember this movie. Yeah. It, it, yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's John, it, John Ward. It's a you know, kind of a late stage slasher film, uh, that has apparently gained a reputation. And I, it's, you know, I barely was aware of it at the time, but clearly it's a, it's enough of a, of a thing that era wanted to bring it back. Uh, your opinion, is it deserving of its repu of its uh, resurrected reputation? Well, it, it, it was, I remember this film from the day a young, a young Anna Ferris is in this film, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it was, a, and it was one that was, uh, you know, it's also, it's also, if it's, if it's, if it's uh, a legacy of that, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a good movie. All right, so let's let's roll through some of these uh, Criterion titles. First off is a film that won our L.A. Film Critics uh, Best Film a few years ago, but was not eligible for Oscars for a whole bunch of dumb reasons. Uh, it was considered a TV miniseries, but uh, it was oh, promoted yes. to us as a series of actual films, individual films, and we treated it as a single work, which I think you have to. Uh, but it is five films by Steve McQueen, uh, Small Acts, which... Uh, is is a chronicle of the lives and experiences of um, families and people with roots in the West Indies who are in the UK in the 70s and 80s. And it's a really interesting thing. It's not, you know, the, what Steve McQueen wanted to do was to explore a particular UK culture, which is not, you know, you can you can break it down. It's kind of like here in the US, you know, there's and you will be the first person to certainly correct me and everybody else on this. It's not like everyone in the United States who's black is monolithic. Mm -mm. There are people from West Africa. There are people from uh, East Africa. There are people who come from, you know, in, in longstanding indigenous populations in, in, in the South, in places like new Orleans, those in the North with more new England, those who are part of the great migration, those who are Caribbean. I mean, these are a lot of different populations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the UK, those who are from the West Indies are very different from those who have their roots in Africa and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a really specific population and their experience of the 70s and 80s is unique. And these five films, I would call a stone cold masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to make one film as an artist. All five of these films are amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'll yes. Let you, I'll yeah, let you go. Yeah, yeah Steve directing uh, all, all five episodes, a few different writers, and 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 what's what was really interesting in watching these films is that while they're about these very particular uh, black communities uh, in London uh, from like the late sixties stretching through the through the early eighties, depending on which episode you're watching, um, uh, there are references in every single one of them that I found as an African American, you know, born in the in, in the uh, in the early sixties here in the United States, totally familiar, totally familiar, all of them. Sometimes literally familiar. The music, uh, if not if not that, the clothes, the tone, the style. Uh, they're all very interesting. They're, 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 some of them are better than others, but they they start at such a high level. Uh, I particularly like the one uh, that's set at that house party. Uh, you know, with that music, uh, 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 lovers uh, rock, lovers rock. That's beautiful. Uh, so good. Uh, the one about the young boy who who, who becomes a, a, a police officer and his father. Red, white, and blue. Red, uh, white, and blue. So good. Another powerful, powerful one. Uh, so yeah. you know, uh, all of them, and um, and. and and, and while they're all very individual, they are of a one. So you should simply watch the entire series. Yeah, I, I, I you know, you don't have to watch it all in one sitting. But no. yeah, it, it's it's really, really absolutely incredible. John Boyega in Red, White and Blue is so, so good. It's the best thing he's ever done. And it's such a deeply affecting story because it deals particularly that one with uh, with all of these conflicts the conflict between education and public service between the native born which is what he is and the immigrant which is his his, his parents yeah the the conflict between obviously you know i mean it, it and, and this doesn't give anything away but he could go on to a a very successful career 
in education and instead he becomes a police officer because he wants to serve the community and he realizes that there are there, that there are there's there are racists on the police force who have been rough with the community and but it gets into conflicts within the community within the family mm-hmm. like there's so much drama in that story and it's just beautifully shot you know McQueen was not my favorite director when he first started he mm-hmm. felt like one of those pretentious Peter Greenaway former painters who comes to the movies <laughs> and tries to tries to do some you know tries to reinvent the wheel like I think of Hunger and that shot of the guy mm-hmm. who's mopping the floor which is like four minutes long and I'm like it's four minute shot of a guy mopping a floor what what are you what, what are you doing why are you why are you doing this to me you're killing me here but then he became a storyteller right and then he started to understand he's not a, you know he can be a painter when he's painting but when you're making a movie you're not a painter you're a storyteller and he now finds you know ways of shooting some of these scenes where he can he finds the place to put the camera and he doesn't move it and he lets the the whole scene transpire in front of the camera without an edit in the most beautifully framed and staged and 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 blocked way that possible he really has become a very very skilled filmmaker and yeah. i just think this mm-hmm. is one of the i i i can't say enough about it I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Is he, he, he learned how to let the image serve the story uh That's it. you know that 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 thing uh you know a few of them had to do that julian julian schnabel had to um the butterfly and uh what did you yeah uh the, yeah. Dive, the diving bell and the butterfly but yes steve mcqueen anyway this is a good series yeah so we also have a bunch of Criterions on 4K. Here's what's on 4K from Criterion. Wings of Desire, uh, freaking Vim Vendors, whose movie, just another movie of his won an award at Cannes just this last week. Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, oh, freaking unbelievable, uh, because it's looked terrible on, on what they've had on Criterion Channel for a while. And The Fisher King, oh my gosh, Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges for Terry Gilliam, and then lastly, Ruben Ostlund's new film that just came out this last year was nominated for a ton of Oscars, including Best Picture, and also uh, won the Palme d'Or, Triangle of Sadness. So let me just first start by saying, because maybe you like Triangle of Sadness. I don't know if you and I have even talked about this movie. This movie, to me, is like a really unfunny version of The Love Boat that becomes Mm. an even less funny version of Gilligan's Island. Mm. I truly don't like this film. I respect Ostland as a a director. I get it. He's won two Palme d'Ors. The Square one, I didn't like The Square either. Mm. I don't like this film at all. I don't know what people see in it. But maybe you do. You tell me. What's the deal with Triangle of Sadness? Yeah, nothing because I don't like it either. But it's also it, it's all it's it's also it's also obvious to me. And is it funny? Okay, I giggle. Uh, but 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 giggling. It's like giggling at somebody slipping on a banana. So you know, yeah. uh, it, you know all the crap that happens on the boat with all the food and all this kind uh-huh. of stuff like that. And I'm like, and and here's the thing. You know, I. I at, at the center of all of this is a sort of disdain for a certain kind of people. So whether we call them, right. whether it's the super rich or the super beautiful or the super yeah. whatever it is that you, you know, take it and, and you can stick it in the eye, disdain for them and all that they have and all that they do. Here's the thing. I, I don't have any uh, disdain for the super rich. I, I don't have any disdain for the ridiculously beautiful. I don't have any disdain for anybody. Uh, if, in and of it th- themselves itself, nothing about anybody. Soup now. Uh, it, 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 there's a given kind of behavior uh, that almost anybody can engage in that I would have disdain for. But nothing about you being rich or about you being pretty yeah. ever is ever going to matter to me. And he, it, which is what this, these films, all of them, even that one. Uh, um, uh, look up. Uh, uh, it does. It it it, it, yeah. it, it confuses that. And, and, and I'm like, I'm, you want me to say that rich people are bad. I know lots of rich people. They aren't bad. <laughs> you know, you know, you, yeah. but, but these rich people are assholes. But assholes yeah. are assholes, whether they have any money <laughs> or not. And that's what these movies don't seem to get right. It, 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 I don't know if that makes any sense. It makes sense. And, and and then for the others, I will just say that the 4K transfers of these combo sets of Seventh Seal, Fisher King, and Wings of Desire are superlative. You got to get them upgrade by all, any means necessary. And especially Wings of Desire, I just want to say I moderated an event with Vim Vendors some years ago. My wife has worked on a number of Vim Vendors films. She was mm. the post-production supervisor on uh, Buena Vista Social Club. So she's you know been very close to Vim over the years. Uh, when we were at the 50th anniversary Cannes Film Festival, that was for I uh, what film was it? End of Violence. So we mm-hmm. went to the 50th anniversary Palm presentation because we were at the the big uh, red carpet for End of Violence. So I, I have a certain affection for Vim. Uh, been on the set of several of his films here, including um, uh, uh, what was the one that they shot downtown? Uh, gosh, I can't even remember the name of it. The hotel movie. 
Oh, uh, million dollar hotel. Yeah. Million dollar hotel. Uh, was it the rap party for that? Gosh, I've been all over Vince's life. That's really <laughs> weird. Still, I remember Jeremy Davies dancing up a storm at that rap party. But anyway, uh, Wings of Desire, when I when I did the moderation thing, Henri Alakan, the cinematographer for this film, who is one of the greats of all time international cinema, all the way back to Jean Cocteau's uh, Beauty and the Beast, did all of those effects in camera. So mm. when those wings are dissolving and disappearing and all this stuff is happening, there is no post-production special effects work happening in Wings of Desire. Alakan did that in real time in camera. Mm. That is old school hardcore. Just know that when you watch the film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last three criterions we got here, uh, Seijin Suzuki's Branded to Kill is also on 4K. Forgot to mention that in the others. That's also available right now in a big Suzuki series on Criterion Channel. Um, it, you know, this is one of those great groovy uh, mm-hmm. kind of quasi-Japanese new wave slash exploitation films mm-hmm. from 1967. A really great era. Everything was groovy and cool. Sexy. Tarantino rips on a lot of this in mm-hmm. Kill Bill, which is also now going to be coming out in 4k soon uh this movie is one of the earliest criterions released that's why it's number 38 and uh, it's now in 4k and it is it's so cool looking Mm -hmm. the color is so cool uh and then uh targets uh bogdanovich's film which was uh mentioned in our documentary schlock the secret history of american movies the first film to really talk about um spree killers and snipers and and that whole horrible social phenomenon uh really interesting problem that he solved with boris karloff and how he used an old corman movie to justify getting corman to actually pay for funding this one Uh, a lot of great stuff in here uh there's an interview with with uh, richard linkladder an audio commentary from 2003 with bogdanovich uh this deserves to be on 4k it's not on 4k it's blu-ray but we'll live with it for now Mm. it's uh, it's wonderful to see targets get the criterion treatment and uh celine siama's petite maman from uh two about two years ago kind of a big deal with lafka didn't really win any awards but a lot of people loved this film i really really did brief film film. yeah i loved it it's great it's like just barely 70 minutes long um really kind of you know it's such a such a fascinating thing this this weird little mother daughter relationship time bending thing that she does and i don't want to give too much away but it's a really it's a very sweet simple but incredibly original film um you know I don't know. Tell what your thoughts. Oh, it was just absolutely beautiful. Uh, uh, wonderfully done. Like, again, you can't, you don't want to give a whole lot away, but it's, it gives you a sense of how things could be, uh, in more than one way. Uh, it, and, and it's, this is how it might feel in this way. And, but if it were like this, it might feel like this. And the film never really get, lets, lets you know which one of these things is, is actually true. Uh, we got some LGBT titles, uh, Tim, I don't know if, had, did you have a chance to, uh, cover any of these? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah several of these, uh, like me, uh, for instance, yeah. uh, I, I kind of like that, uh, E.L. Cantor, I think it is. It's a, it's a neat, it's funny. We talked about Dawson's Creek earlier. Uh, this has a whole lot in common with Dawson's Creek. It's just about this kid who's in school. He's, he he get, gets kicked out. He's working for this photographer and they have this sort of intense relationship and he's kind of you know, uh, has a crush on his friend. And it's just this very gentle, very sweet little movie with a whole lot of great uh, 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 performances uh, that I that I quite enjoyed. I got a chance to check out uh, hi- uh, one Highway One. Uh, it, but I, I, I don't know if there are any um, uh, um, uh, uh, anything on any of these. So so chime in if there no is. extras. Oh, no, no extras. No. Yeah, you're driving yeah. crazy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Highway One's pretty good. Uh, uh, it's about a New Year's Eve party. Almost all of it takes place in the same place. Jacqueline Bethany and a, a couple of great performances there from some lo- lovely uh, young folks. Uh, and I also checked out uh, Blood Red Ox, uh, which is just a straight up uh, 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 South American rainforest film uh, with a whole lot of um, uh, uh, a whole lot of mystical stuff going on behind 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 the scenes which is interesting because the film is really more about that than it is anything else um uh, which was pretty good uh and then this is beautiful one called bean thunder which is set um uh in the native american community of, of up around rhode island 
Um, and, and it's just beautiful. And uh, but, it, but it's set in this community where there are these a couple of kids, uh, uh, a, a queer kid, a, a straight kid and this uh, sort of transgender kid in this Native American community and all of the stuff that's sort of going on. Yes, we, look, you wouldn't think to combine all of these things, but it's like it references and I just, I thought it was just perfectly lovely, perfectly lovely. We attend all of these ceremonies where they're wearing this Native American dress and, and uh, just bright and beautiful stuff. It's really just sort of lovely, lovely. Stephanie Lattimore uh, there in this film, and she's sort of like at the center of all of it. That's, she's the young person who's there, so check that one out. It's, it's a documentary. All right. And uh, let's see what else we've got here. We got some foreign films. We should probably get to The Quiet Girl uh, is on DVD. That was nominated for an Oscar yeah. just this past year. The first ever Irish film that is in the Irish language. And it's funny, I was at a, at a, at a press event for this, and everyone kept asking the, dire- <laughs> the director and the people there, because they're they, they're like, what? so what is the name of the Irish language? Is it like Gaelic? Or is there, they're hoping that it's some name like uh, Gilthrelkatel or you know, <laughs> some Gaelic sounding thing. And everyone kept saying like, what's, so what do you call the Irish language? Like this, what's spoken in this film? What do we, what do you call it? And the, and there was always a beat. And then the answer was always Irish. <laughs> That's it. It's the Irish language. That's what it's called. Yeah. It's Irish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's simpler than you would expect. It's what it's uh, called. It's what we are called. It's what the place is called. <laughs> it's, 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 all, it's all the one thing. I love this movie. It was so sweet. And the title was is so correct, correct quiet girl. And she goes to yeah. the family. She's sent, shipped off her. She has just, you know, goofy, these goofy parents. And they, they ship her off to live, you know, with, with these, you know, with her old. And these, it, it's about how, um, her family becomes sort of stabilized. Her sense of family becomes stabilized living with this old couple. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and it's just beautiful. There's almost nothing that happens in this movie, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's, 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 it's a, beautiful. it's a wonderful, it's like a slice of a sliver of life. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's really, it's very, mm-hmm. very just intimate, incredibly nicely observed. And it, um, you know, that's the thing about, movies is that there's an assumption that when you're telling a story that you need to have a certain breadth you need to start in a certain place and end in a certain place and and you only have 100 minutes 120 minutes maybe 150 minutes on the outside Mm. to make that journey and when you do that there are certain things that you just don't have time to observe along the way and the nice thing about calm uh bariad who who wrote and directed this Mm -hmm. is that he just decided you know what i'm just not going to step that far back i'm going to get in really very detailed finely observed and i'm going to just make a whole movie about a much more simple and quiet and and intimate uh trajectory than what would normally be considered an acceptable feature film and it's it's so refreshing it Mm -hmm. really is Mm -hmm. i just wish it was on blu-ray i wish they'd have done a blu-ray of it but you know Mm -hmm. i'll take the i'll take the dvd yeah um the Oscar-winning Indochin is also out, finally, on Blu-ray from Sony Pictures Classics. Uh, Regis Varnier never got nominated again, but still a very, you know, epic uh, director, makes mm-hmm. a lot of big movies, uh, has made a lot of big movies in France. Anyway, Indochine, big melodrama, you know, Catherine Deneuve mm-hmm. and um, um, the other actor whose name is escaping oh, yeah, moment. Yeah, 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 Vincent uh, Perez. Vincent Perez. Vincent yeah. Perez. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, along with you know, uh, Lindan Pham and mm-hmm. uh, Jean Yan, all takes place during the French Indo-Chinese period, and Catherine Deneuve is the owner of this you know very successful rubber plantation, and then it gets into the you know the uh, the communist uprising, which turns into the Indo-Chinese War, which of course turns into the American Vietnam, but a tremendous movie really a tremendous movie and it's very interesting too a little story about how it became the oscar winner uh there are always arguments in countries like france which have very established film industries which movie you're going to submit for consideration in the what was then best foreign language is now the best international film Mm. and uh at the time this year because i had i remember i had lived in france just shortly before Mm. um there was a huge debate over whether or not it would be Indochine, which they considered the more commercial and tr- international choice, or All the Mornings of the World, Tous les Matins du Monde, starring Gerard Depardieu, which is all about this very obscure 
quasi like cello instrument, which is almost extinct now. Almost no one uses it. I forget the exact name of it. Um, uh, it's like the, the violoncello or something like that. And it's, it's a string instrument that very few pieces are, are performed anymore. Mm. And this movie is about <coughs> that instrument and the drama that goes on with a master of it and all this stuff. And anyway, beautiful period film, but the soundtrack for that film, which is all of this Baroque string music was like a number one album seller in France that year. Mm. And so a lot of people in the French film industry thought, Oh, we got to submit this one. And the sensible people said, you realize this movie is popular with no one, but people in France. (laughs) It is so parochial. I get it that everyone in France loves this movie, but the Oscars will not love this movie. Mm. The Oscars will however, love Indochine because it predicts the American quagmire in Vietnam. Mm. They'll connect to it in a more global sense. They prevailed, and sure enough, it won the Oscar. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the story of Indochine. It's a very, very interesting story. Mm. Uh, let, let's see. Goliath by Frederick Tellier. Did you see Goliath? Uh, did I see Goliath? Which one are we talking about? So, Goliath by Frederick Tellier, really, really uh, tough f- um, cop story about this um, uh, about a school teacher who's po- who, whose husband is poisoned by pesticides and it turns into kind of a, an anti-chemical anyway, uh, it, 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 it's, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of a, what was that one that Julia Roberts made back in the, uh, the, 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 with the, where she's, you know, in, and they're poisoning the water. Uh, um, Aaron Brockovich. Brockovich. Yeah. So it's like if, if you had Aaron Brockovich, but with just a, a, um, a grittier edge to it. Mm. And it's like a much more, you know, I mean, it, it just, it, it's, it's, it's almost some, it's almost like somewhere between a, um, an Aaron Brockovich and a, well, how do I even put it? Um, it's just a really interesting film. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a police thriller, but it's a little bit of an environmental thriller at the same time, mm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So it kind of splits the difference between the two. Um, it was, it was screened at the French film festival in the UK. I wish it had been screened at our, our Colcoa, which is no longer called Colcoa, but anyway, mm. it's a really good film. Goliath worth checking out. Gilles Lelouch, who I love as an actor is just tremendous in it as well. Really, really a, a tough, tough, good film. Oh, Leonore will never die. Mm-hmm. Leonore will never die. Um, a this is from, by Martika Ramirez Escobar, and it is a completely uh, crazy uh, comedy. This is from Music Box Films, and uh, it's a oh, comedy. The one where fam- gets the TV on her head. This is funny. It's the. It's a Filipino comedy, yeah. and you know the Filipino industry is very, very small. But yeah, go ahead. You, you. I, you it, it it, it, if she's this filmmaker, she gets this TV and falls on her head. It's extremely uh, uh, hysterically funny, uh, and she becomes this action hero. But she's like this old lady, and that's what makes it. That's what makes it absolutely hysterical. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that was that was very, very good. Uh, sometimes Fili- the, the, these Filipino comedies are really, really just very sharp. I uh, got another one here by a filmmaker named Hadas Ben Arroya, which is All Eyes Off Me. And uh, this is from uh, this is an Israeli film from uh, Film Movement. Comes with a really, really great little short film on here called Daddy's Girl by Lena Hudson. Really, really terrific, which is an American film, mm. uh, an American uh, short film uh, that uh, won the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. So the short film, I would almost say, is reason enough to pick this up. It's terrific. Daddy's Girl is really, really good. Mm. But um, now, as an Israeli film, the. Um, uh, all eyes off me is is one of those great little gritty uh, Israeli um, youth movies that that deals with some of the tougher parts of Israeli culture that you know the that they may not necessarily want exported, but it's <laughs> you know they they there's there are unwanted pregnancies in Israel too. I know mm-hmm. nobody wants to sort of admit that, but that happens there. All those things happen there. And uh, you have kids who are, you know, and young people who are getting themselves into trouble and life situations that uh, that they do everywhere else, too. And, um, you know, the awkwardness of those relationships, that's kind of the center of this. You've got, uh, y- you know, uh, all of that, all those awkward things and all of the, the, the sexual politics that go along with that are a part of um, Israeli culture as well. So All Eyes Off Me is uh, is also well worth checking out. 
Yep, yep. Uh, let's see. Well, everything went fine. I'm going to make a mention of this because it's Cohen and I'm fond of everybody at Cohen, but also because it has Sophie Marceau in it and uh, she's ageless. Francois Ozon, who we always love, directed uh, Sophie Marceau and Charlotte Rampling and Andre Dussolier in this in this really, really fascinating movie. Uh, Hannah I love this movie. Movie. It's, it's a beautiful movie. It, it's, you know, o- Ozon just never stops making great movies and he makes so many of them. Um, I mean, it's just a family reconciliation drama, but everyone in it is just on their game, just so on their game. Um, I mean, your thoughts? Well, this is one of those uh, old, old, old guy uh, who's a great guy, and he has a uh, 85 years old, and, and, and he has a stroke, and he has his daughter who, who's bananas about him, and he wants her to, you know, help him, uh, in, 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 you know, finish it all, and, and, and she's struggling with all of that. And it's just a sort of beautiful movie, and it sort of works through all of this, uh, through this excellent, excellent set of performances by just everybody here, uh, and, and, and it's sweet, and it's and, and it's moving, and. Uh, uh, and it doesn't particularly land on any answers. It's just a really, really neat movie. Charlotte Rampling's in it and uh, uh, Sophie Marceau, as you say. And uh, it's really, really good. Great performance by, what's his name? Andre, who plays the father. Dussolier. Uh, Dussolier. Dussolier. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see if I've got any others that I want to make mention of real fast because we're getting close to time here. Um, there's a few quickly here uh philip stozel's chess story uh which is based on a novel by stefan zweig uh this is also from film movement and takes place in vienna in that uh, tempestuous late 30s moment just before uh world war ii when the nazis have already executed the anschluss and they've absorbed austria and it is now under complete and total nazi occupation and, mm-hmm. and control and uh it stars o- uh, oliver masucci mm-hmm. as a doctor who's about to just run and he's he wants he wants no more part of it but then before he can get to america you know like like they do in the end of the sound of music right he can't get out of the country so he's arrested by the gestapo and um he uh, he he has knowledge that they want, and so now you get into this really interesting uh, battle where they try to squeeze him in solitary confinement for everything that they can, and um, he saves himself from the horror of that moment through chess, mm. and uh, it's it's such a fascinating look. Not at chess, but at how how people can find strategies for for keeping themselves sane in insane moments and circumstances. It's really uh, very, very well done. It's really very, very interesting. And, um, you know, Philip Stolzel is is quite a a, an accomplished filmmaker. So uh, great cast, terrific production value. Mm. Good. And it also has a bonus short film. I uh, bet Christoph Daniel and Mark uh, Schmidaini called Der Tunnel, meaning the tunnel, in case you didn't know that. So mm-hmm. it's a <laughs> interesting, interesting thing takes place on a train and through a train tunnel. Anyway, chess story on DVD, not on Blu-ray, worth checking out. And the Joseph Sarno retrospect series from uh, Film Movement Classics has a new double feature on it, Moonlighting Wives and the Naked Fog. Sarno, kind of a, an artsy exploitation figure. Um these are these are not great movies, but they are kind of salacious, but they're salacious and erotic in a very uh, artful way, or at least a way that uh, believes that it's artful. So mm. um, this is strictly for fans of Sarno and his particular uh, body of work, but uh, Moonlighting Wives and the Naked Fog. Joe Santos. Santos. <laughs> Joe, I love Joe. Yeah. Joe, Joe. Joe is in a lot of Rockford Files, a lot of, yeah. uh, you know, he pops up in these movies. Love Joe. Yeah. It's good. Good. So, some some interesting cast surprises there, and uh, I'll do these last three here. Um, Eric Gravel made a movie called Full Time, which is, stars Laura Calamy as a single mother who is, and this is a thing in these French independent films. The the travails of single moms and working moms are a number of these movies. It's almost like a subgenre. Anyway. Uh, uh, it's uh, she's she, she's just got this unbelievably horrible situation where she has to work and drop the kids off and do all of this stuff every single day. And it almost becomes like a 
it, 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 the, the film is really anxiety inducing. She's trying to get a new job. She's working at this food establishment, but she's trained for a better job and she's interviewing with corporations, but she has to somehow conform her kid's schedule to the demands of the job and she's got to travel and then she has to run back and pick up and she's got to call her buddy who's, you know, pick my kids up. I'm not going to be back in time. I just missed the train. I mean, it's all of this kind of anxiety inducing juggling every ball that you can possibly imagine. It's really, really kind of just a, a grueling movie mm-hmm. to watch, but it, it, it's, it's bracing and her performance. Laura Calamy is amazing in this performance because somehow she just, you know, considering that they shot this thing, you know, when you shoot a movie, it's a pretty casual, you get out there. All right, take one, take two. And then you have to bring the anxiety in the moment of the take mm-hmm. so that when it all edits together, it's, it's seamless anxiety. So when you realize the extent of her performance, I mean, she must have just gone on the treadmill for like five minutes before every take mm. because she's she never stops panting. It's a really, really good movie. Oh, Full yeah. Time is what it's called. Yep. Uh, and then uh, Return to Soul. Um, this got a lot of love during during our, our, our uh, Lafka voting as well. Were you a fan of this? I was uh, a, a fan, a, a fan of the movie. It's about this, 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 this young woman who does exactly that. She was she was adopted out uh, during that period when a lot of that was happening uh, from South Korea, both of the Koreas, but certainly South Korea, uh, to to here in the United States and to families in Paris. So you would have these Korean children adopted out to these uh, French uh, uh, parents. Uh, and she has this opportunity to to return to Seoul, to go to Seoul for the first time since she was a baby, actually, and happens to meet, isn't interested in meeting, but happens to meet her birth parents. Uh, and, 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 and then uh, this, this film, this, this film unfolds. And it's a very interesting film, very powerful, very emotional. Um, uh, and it was a couple of really great performances, but particularly from Park, Jim, Ming. All, they're re- really all really, really great. It's a very, very moving and interesting film because it, it, it becomes a film that, it, that you do not think that it sets out to be. Uh, it just sort of happens the way it sort of happens. It's very interesting. I liked it too. I liked it too. I, uh, I, I, I wasn't sure how I felt about it at the time we were voting. I, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that had to kind of grow on me, but, um, anyway, yeah, it's out on Blu-ray from uh, Sony pictures classics. And then lastly, only on Blu-ray also from uh, film movement, but, uh, quite good is another French film called a bag of marbles by Christian Duguay. Um, also, you know, based on a novel, I also wish this was on, on Blu-ray because it has just absolutely beautiful product period production value. Another World War II era thing. We're never going to run out of World War II era stories. Um, but uh, it takes place during the Nazi occupation of Paris. Mm. And it's one of these wonderful movies about the how the innocence of childhood and the resilience of children can kind of survive under inclement conditions. Not playing chess, not learning from chess, but just the strength of, of children, which we often underestimate. And uh, this little 10-year-old kid um, who, you know, doesn't uh, – he, he little 10-year-old Jewish kid. The, the, here's the premise here is mm-hmm. that um, he – well, I won't I won't say it. The, the bag of marbles is significant. I won't mm-hmm. say what the bag of marbles uh, represents and what what goes on with it. But the bag of marbles is both a real story device and then also a symbol. And uh, it's it's quite beautiful about how this how this family, how this precipitates this family's uh, attempt to to escape and flee and uh, get to what then is is the um, the area of Vichy, France, which is the free zone of France that was still overseen by the Nazis, but was given a limited degree of uh, self-rule and autonomy. Mm. Uh, anyway, it's it's a it's a it's based on an autobiography by Joseph Jaffo, and it's uh, it's really uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. Deserves to be on Blu-ray. Please put this out on Blu-ray. Mm. Bag of Marbles. I'm sure we'll get it at some point. All right. With that, let's uh, bring the show to a close. Mm. Uh, I'll try not to wait so many weeks until the next one. You got, <laughs> hey, you got man. anything planned? We had to get out of the world. We had to get out of the world and do some stuff. So <laughs> yeah. do some stuff. A lot of stuff. Still got a lot of stuff going on. More than I can possibly count. Uh, you got anything planned for the for the the early part of the summer? Uh, not 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 a whole lot. May 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 roam around back and forth. I, I, my my niece is in uh, New York, so I might go to where you just oh, nice. came from uh, to visit with her. But you know, kind of kind of going to check out these big summer movies and see what's what. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? How's it feeling out there to you? 
uh, uh, here's what's feeling to me. Well, funny, we talked about this on Film Week this week. Um, you know, what, what are we looking at with the summer movies? Uh, you know, um, I think a lot of stuff's going to do well. I don't think anything is going to do as well as they think it will. Mm. Obviously, people are looking at uh, Elemental from Pixar. They're looking at The Flash. Those open on the same day. Mm. Um, they, they're, you know, they're looking at a, at a number of things. The Indiana Jones film. I don't think any of that is going to perform like people are thinking it will. Mm. But I'll tell you think, what I do think is going to Thinking or hoping it will. Thinking or hoping. I think I people mean, are I'm, hoping... I think they're hoping that those movies will perform uh, on blockbuster level like like previous films uh, mm. have. I don't think this summer is there yet. I don't think audiences are there yet. I don't I don't think the movies necessarily will warrant it. I think mm. people are, you know, the Spider-Man movie is going to open big. But I think people are a little fatigued with a lot of these things. But you know what last year taught me was there's one thing people are not fatigued with. And that is Mr. Tom Cruise. Yeah. And for that reason, I think Mission Mission, the Impossible, next Mission yeah. Impossible, which is the first of a two part kind of concluding chapter to the Mission Impossible films. I think that thing is going to blow the doors off of everything else this year. I have watched those trailers. I can't get enough of them. They get me so excited. And, you know, he rode a motorcycle off a cliff, bro. He <laughs> rode a motorcycle off a cliff. That's not CGI. That's uh, Tom Cruise sitting yeah. around going, what have I not done in my career yet? I'm 60. What's on my bucket list? I know. I'll ride a motorcycle off a cliff. That, you know, that's that's a little crazy. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, I, I do think that that what they have planned in that film is something amazing. And if you read that story, which I think was in The Atlantic, about how the the pandemic imp- remember Tom Cruise lost his mind while on set shooting this thing, yelling at everybody, you know, wear yeah. your masks and, you know, we're good because everybody was kind of getting down on him for being kind of well look he's the producer of a movie which was budgeted at like 200 million dollars and wound up costing about 300 million Mm -hmm. and all of that money is on his shoulders and the insurance company is is all over this everybody has something riding on this You, you you gotta understand that's not a prima donna star losing his mind that is a responsible producer insisting that people be professional and not put that production at risk for everyone else. And he quite rightly raised the point. This movie needs to happen. It can't get shut down because not because of me, not because I need all this money, but because all of these people here, these electricians and these gaffers and these grips, these are working class people who need this movie to happen during the pandemic to be able to pay their mortgages. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a good man. That's a responsible filmmaker. And mm-hmm. for that reason, I have every hope that this movie, over budget and over schedule as it was all over the globe, I think it's going to blow up and it deserves to. And I'm rooting for it. I'm rooting for it too. Uh, look, he's the CEO of what I like to call uh, one of the industries of Hollywood. Uh, uh, we think of Hollywood as an industry, Hollywood is an industry, but within yep. the, the Hollywood industry, there are industries. And these industries of Hollywood include that Mission Impossible friend. friend. Yep. Uh, you know, a 20, 25 year old. There, there are whole companies uh, that yep. come and go in less than 25 years. Uh, that, you know, there, nobody buys a Blackberry anymore. Uh, but yep. there are industries of Hollywood uh, um, uh, that, that fast and furious uh, set of films just to argue that that um, that have done exactly what you said. And some, in yep. generally, at the t- at, at the top of these industries of Hollywood uh, is a CEO, and Tom Cruise yep. is one is one of those CEOs. Yep, indeed. Absolutely indeed. All right, with that we are done and uh we will uh, we will catch you guys on the next show. Cool.